Hi and welcome to our one year anniversary episode of Insomnia Japan. Yay! I'm Ela and virtually next to me but 9000 kilometers away is my good friend Dari. <laughs> Hello. Our topic for today is media and as you might already noticed, we switched languages. That is because we have a guest today who refuses to speak German for some completely <laughs> incomprehensible reason. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> Why is that? Oh, God. I don't know. I mean I was so bad at German at school. <laughs> that would be a disaster. <laughs> All right. So this guest you just heard is living in Japan for nine years and doing YouTube for nine years. And I think five, five years full time, right? That is right. Yes. Five years yes, I as guess a YouTuber right. full time. God, <laughs> how the years fly. Yeah. And you've been featured in Japanese TV and newspapers. And one thing <laughs> which I never accept to happen You managed to be on the iTunes top 20 single charts last week. <laughs> so hi, Chris. And how the hell did you manage to pull that off? Hello, everyone. Yes, I don't really know. It's very odd making a song on your phone, your mobile phone. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, thousands of people have downloaded it and it's charting top 20 on iTunes. It's a very surreal thing, but quite funny. And hilarious, and it's going on my CV one day when my YouTube career comes to a grinding halt, and I've got a CV and I have to hand it in. That's going to be top of the CV. Got an iTunes top fifth, top fifteen songs on the singles chart. What a joke, God! Yeah, <laughs> because I think a lot of YouTubers actually would really want that. They're doing music, and I think they would like, be so real. so proud of themselves. <laughs> Not like, oh, it went there by accident. <laughs> I. I'm kind of I'm looking forward to finding out how many people actually bought it. With iTunes there's actually a three month delay, right? So someday in September I'll be like really depressed and down. I'll be like, Oh, I hate my life and then I'll get like an email from iTunes being like, By the way, ten thousand people downloaded your song that you made on your phone. So it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be an interesting day in September, but uh yeah, it's it's just pretty fun. I mean, it costs, for those of you wondering how much it costs to get a song on iTunes, it costs a staggering $19.99. So it's actually quite cheap and very easy. So um, it could be the most profitable thing, the pro most profitable uh, expense I've ever done, if it works out and if people have actually bought it. But I guess we'll find out soon. I was just about to say 10,000 people downloaded it and you're getting three cents <laughs> of it. Yeah. That's the sad truth, isn't it, about music and downloads. So, yeah, yeah could be nothing, really. But still, so you, I'm happy with it. you can actually listen, listen to it for free or you can actually pay for it on iTunes. I think if you've, it's on also on Spotify. The song's called Too Much Volcano. Uh, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's a song we made on Japan's biggest volcano. And it was a challenge that started as a joke and the joke went too far. And the song that we made in nine hours turned out to be all right, like not absolutely terrible um, but yeah you can download it and listen to it now it's on itunes spotify apple music so people can listen to it for free if you've got apple music or spotify so you should definitely do that after this podcast <laughs> shamefully plugging my song yeah so first of all you assume that we have people <laughs> listening to this podcast which is very nice thank you very much <laughs> always the same there are a few listening. i haven't looked in the stats for a while actually but there are people listening because we were pushed very very early on that was so awkward very surreal from one of the <laughs> so for me she's one of the souls of german podcasting and she promoted our podcast after two episodes and i was like how did you even find it <laughs> yeah so uh, yeah it's how the best podcasts start out just talking about something you're passionate about and people will find it believe it or not they will find it Yeah, true. But it normally takes a while in, in podcasting until it's on Spotify and iTunes and if you're actually searchable and so on. Um, yeah, I wanted to start somewhere else because normally I'm asking Dari how her two weeks, because we, we are always recording every two weeks, how her two weeks have been. So I would ask our guest, of course, how have you been in the last two weeks? Me? How have I been? Um, 
think look busy is the key word because I've been <laughs> developing this kind of series on on YouTube. I've got my own mm-hmm. podcast and uh, running around doing all sorts of things. What have I done the last few weeks? I don't know. Staying clear of Tokyo because of COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. I think I might have a vaccine lined up as well, so that's exciting. Oh, that's a fun. vaccine, woo. Um, but uh, yeah, mainly just editing in a room over and over, which is uh it's fun at first but once you've done it for four weeks running editing really takes its toll and um yeah i'm looking forward to this this month being over with to be honest june has been the most incredible month for abroad in japan we've had i think more viewers than ever before uh something like 10 mm-hmm. million views but it comes at a personal cost right you know the harder you work the more success you have but the more burnt out you are so yeah i'm looking forward to this five-part series that i've been working on to to come to a halt and then I'm going to pretend I'm going to sit in a room for like a day. And I, I don't think I've had a holiday in a long time. I can't remember the last time I had a holiday. Do you, have you had a holiday? Oh, <laughs> no. Well, I, I, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm not having so much holidays, but due to some changes in my life, I'm going to have, I think, 10 weeks and lining up like end of July. And then uh, I had three weeks at the beginning of this year, which is a shame because it's COVID and I can't go anywhere. So it's like mm. basically wasted a vacation. So that's sad. But Come to me. Well, yeah, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our adventures always start out like that. So, hey, Dari, yeah. I hate my life right now. She's like, all right, <laughs> come over. Okay. That, the first time it, it went like that. Like it was literally like, okay, I book a flight. I come. I'm, I'm there in one week. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, how God. about in, in, in two weeks? Uh, um, all right. Yeah. <laughs> but it was great. But I, I worked at a university, so it, it went well. I just... <laughs> we worked <laughs> from like home or travel. Work, eh? <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean, it feels like the whole... Um, because of COVID and everything, it feels like the whole the whole world has not had a holiday in a year, in a weird kind of way, collective crap year. It's kind of a, a strange thing, isn't it? The whole planet going through that, but... Yeah, it's been it's been rubbish not having friends come to Japan or not being able to go home easily. It's all just been one very long, bizarre kind of year. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to when folks can actually come to Japan again and actually visit and stuff. Seems like a million years ago now when there was people here. It's crazy. I always came over in March, but I didn't. Mm. And then it wasn't possible anymore. So I'm a bit mad about myself that I didn't go. <laughs> Hopefully you can make up for it soon. Okay, so um, our podcast is also known for us derailing massively. (laughs) And all right, so two things I forgot already is your YouTube channel is, of course, Abroad in Japan, who didn't guess it by now. And um, I forgot the second thing I just wanted to mention. So we just start. Because I thought (laughs) that, yeah, that's how our podcast is like. (laughs) Um, Brilliant. (laughs) Well, all good podcasts are a natural conversation, right? Like I do a podcast every week and the worst ones are the ones where we always have a plan. The best ones are the ones where we can just talk about anything, right? Have yeah, a natural that is true. conversation. So. so normally we always uh, prepare a topic and then I'm always normally asking Diary how she's been and sometimes that's just the whole podcast because we're talking for two yeah. hours then. But recently... Stuff. Nothing much happened. <laughs> yeah, so that's the issue. And I remembered what I forgot to thank you uh, for your time, because I know <laughs> you're still editing this journey across Japan. No, not at all. And speaking of your YouTube channel and influence and stuff, I originally planned to start somewhere else, but since you landed that top 20, uh, I don't know, 14 <laughs> or something hit. I, top 14, it, don't remember that number. <laughs> 14 <laughs> top 14 top 14 oh yeah ridiculous number god <laughs> i just suddenly realized how much reach you have and because that wouldn't work without reach to be honest which is great and influencer <laughs> influencer yeah, i guess so yeah, yeah. so so i thought um about your influence what do you think your channel has changed um that's a good question, I guess. What changed for you with all the influence? I don't know, really. I, you try not to think about the whole influence thing, to be honest. Um, it's always a bit daunting mm. when you 
picture people watching your videos. You know, I've whenever I post a video, folks send me like photos on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or whatever of them like watching the video in their sitting room, and that is a really strange thing because I never see that. Like this is a job where you make videos out in a forest or on a volcano, too much volcano, or in your apartment, and then you hit a button and then a million people watch it, and so it can be quite difficult to align those two things right it can be quite difficult to to picture that but i don't know how much it's changed i remember i think you certainly become a lot more aware of what you're saying you certainly become a lot more wary because mm. you think oh my god i've got to be careful i don't want to offend too many people i don't want to you know i don't want to alienate people so i guess that's the main difference like i remember one problem i faced two two or three years into doing abroad in japan was i met i think like a 40 year old Japanese woman who watched abroad in Japan and that was not the image of someone I pictured watching my videos right I had a very clear cut image of people watching my videos it's probably going to be a British guy 18 to 35 in the UK whatever that's kind of my my image so when I met this Japanese woman who tuned into every episode it was like oh my god that's that's awkward for me to picture like this Japanese woman listening to my cynical sarcastic commentary and thinking, is she going to get it? Is she going to get the humour? Is she just going to think I'm a monster? So, yeah, and that changed my personality and the way I presented for a long time. And I stopped being as funny as I used to be. I toned it down. So whatever you imagine your audience to be, that really affects your performance as a presenter. Um, so that's something that changed. But once I realised that, I kind of reverted. And uh, I'd say I'm kind of more or less still as cynical as I used to be. But... Yeah, the trick is not to try and change anything. To try and stay as authentic as you can, you know. That's all I'll say on that. Like, the channels that lose it all are the ones that just kind of stop making it authentic about themselves and, uh, you know, distance themselves from the, the viewers a bit and stop reading the comments and things like that. Like, I still read all the comments on my videos and um, I, I know a lot of YouTubers don't when they hit a million, but I think it's really important to do that. Otherwise, you forget the people that made you what you are. You know, if that makes kind of sense. Yeah. It does, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that it might not have so much impact on your daily life because mm. your viewers are around the world. Because that's something you hear from German YouTubers a lot that they can't really go outside because mm. it's very dense to like Germany, Austria, Switzerland. <laughs> well, yeah. So if yeah, you have two point. million viewers here, so that's all in Germany and Austria and maybe a bit of Switzerland. Mm. I mean, I, yeah, I do get spotted out in Japan. Uh, that's the only good thing about COVID is it's not been as bad because there's no tourists, right? But uh, I guess that's another change. I do take taxis slightly more when I go somewhere like Tokyo or Kyoto. Uh, I remember I was on a train in Tokyo once on the Ginza line and I started, I got on a Asakusa and I was riding it to Shibuya and literally at every station another foreign tourist got on and recognised me And by the end, there was like eight people standing around me in a circle when we got to Shibuya. And it turned into this oh, like no. impromptu meetup on the Ginza line just because people were getting on going, oh, wait, are you Chris? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I am. And uh, so that's kind of strange. But if you're really busy or you're not having a good day, you don't want to necessarily have that kind of situation. But uh, yeah, but it's nice running into people. It's kind of fun. So usually it's okay to talk to you. <laughs> I, I've <laughs> for your yeah, fans. I've never, I've never really been angry at anyone for coming and saying hello. There was one guy in Kyoto that didn't get the hint that it was time to sort of walk away now. Like I was like, well, good luck with everything, and then I'd slightly walk away, and then he'd be like, just carry on talking again. And I was, I think I was showing my cousin around at the time, and I was just like, oh, come on, get the hint, you know. Um, but no, generally it's been great. I've, I've never had any bad situations. Apart from that, I think. Um, but the, the worst situations where you know somebody recognizes you and they keep staring at you and you just think, oh, come over and say hello. <laughs> like, I don't mind if you come and say hello, but just don't keep staring and making it awkward because you know it's going to happen at some point. I, I had I had this situation. I was in Tokyo for something, for some business trip. And I also some of those famous lines. I can't remember which one. And I saw PDR, son. Oh, PDR, Duncan. You know yeah, yeah, is. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes, Duncan. And um, so it's like, oh no, oh no, is it him? Oh, <laughs> can I can, can I go say hi? Like, oh shit. Okay, so at some point I was like trying not to stare, but of course you take the same train. Like, what do you want to do? So I'm like, hmm, okay, I should I should not be like this. I should just say hi and leave and just go far away <laughs> and take another one, maybe the next train or something. Um, 
So I actually decided, okay, I went and I said, oh, hi, I know you. Greetings to me, May. And I never went away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'd have been he'd have been delighted about that, you know. I think those are the good encounters where someone's like, <laughs> "Hi, Chris, how you doing? You good? Like the videos X, Y, Z, and then sort of <laughs> off you go, kind of thing. Unless you're some, you know. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, I mean, Duncan's. Yeah, I've met Duncan twice. He's a nice guy. He's a cool guy. Yeah, but uh, I think Germans have the tendency to stare more than other people. <laughs> really? I have a feeling because we are, we are very much a staring at people country. <laughs> That's Sorry. awkward. But speaking of influence, it's always so unsettling if you hold your phone live in the camera. <laughs> because I think in the span of one year, at least two YouTubers managed to reveal the number of their YouTube friends just by holding their phone in the camera live and then they got a call oh, or God. whatever. <laughs> so every time you're doing that, I'm thinking, oh God, please stop. <laughs> so, well, sometimes I put the phone on airplane mode, so don't worry, people can't ring. Although, All right. if I hadn't, if I if I didn't do it, you know, there's lots of situations where I'm doing like a live show or something, and then uh, my good friend Natsuki mm. will like ring, ring me up, and I think, oh God, and I put him on the live show as well. So it is a bit risky, but I like to live dangerously. I like to show my phone in the live show. <laughs> even if it ends my career one day. <laughs> More likely the career of, I don't know, who's calling you. <laughs> um, C-Doc VA, for example. And oh, yeah. we're also known for doing dead translations, because uh, transitions, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of filming your wacky weekend with Connor. Ah, uh, yes. So what's about filming permissions? Did you actually need to ask people to film? When do we need to ask? So... Yeah, I mean, with Japan, asking for permission is always a dangerous thing because if they say no, then you're you're buggered, right? You know, once they've turned you down, it can't happen. So the rule of thumb is just to not really ask unless you know somebody who knows the owner. Um, so I did a video, yeah, Wacky Weekend with Connor, Sea Dog VA, and we went to two love hotels and we knew the owner at one of them and he was very nice, let us film. And then the other one we went to... We didn't know the owner, and it you know it was a cheap, not overly great love hotel, and we were a little bit disparaging, a little bit mean to the hotel, and uh, so obviously we couldn't really ask for permission and be like, by the way, can we make fun of your hotel in front of a million people? Um, so, but we hid the name of the lo we hid the name of the hotel, so it should be okay. But uh, yeah, in Japan, it's a bit risky asking for permission though. Because of the hierarchy of mm -hmm. things, the supervisor needs to ask the boss of the boss of the boss. It goes up so many levels, and by that point, they just don't care, and you never hear back. So um, my advice is just don't ask for permission a lot of the time, unless you know somebody who knows the owner, and they can sort of talk to them and get them in, you know. It's just not worth it. Yeah, I guess it's the same at work as well. So we had this silent agreement at my previous work that do home office whenever you want, but don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, be because I I know I was once in Don Quixote and just wanted to film something and I felt like really uncomfortable because I felt like the people were staring if I'm actually filming. Mm. Is that a thing? Hates Don Quixote uh, filming there? Or is it okay-ish? Especially if you don't plan to put it on YouTube or something. I think it's okay. I filmed in Don Quixote three or four right. times. Actually, the one in Tokyo in Shibuya you can't film there i know that much i think we did try filming in there once and got told that we couldn't so it depends on the place but just be a bit sneaky about it i did do a video there once though about don quixote and that i never got told to take it down so again as long as you don't get caught um i think you're okay really because i've never heard from any japanese company telling me to remove a video and i you know i've made 200 videos now so um i think it's more like as long as you just don't get caught it's okay It's okay oh, to break the rules. I remember, was it when you were here? Like, um, there's a mall nearby my place, which is pretty big. And at some point I did some small video clips in that one. And I have this camera that you can flip around so you can see yourself, oh, right? right? But I was filming something and seeing myself and I could see in the finder that somebody behind me was like, Oh, God. Oh, no, no, stop filming. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, shit. Oh, good God. I mean, the, the reason they panic is because they can get in a lot of trouble if you filmed other customers. Mm. It's usually about filming other customers. So... Sometimes if you ask, can I film here? They'll be, they'll say yes, just don't get any other customers in the shot. Um, so that's the main reason why they say no most of the time. Just they don't want other customers having their uh, privacy compromised. 
or whatnot. <laughs> because they care so much about privacy. Well, it's not just yeah, that. It's because there's a lot of people cheating on their partners <laughs> and things in Japan. Like, there was a lawsuit a few years ago, I yeah, think, that was... on TV when um, a guy was caught walking around with another girl and then his wife left him and he sued the, the TV company and got lots of money. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of infidelity in Japan. Um, so I guess I can yes. see why they're a little bit wary about that in that regard. But that, that, it's odd. Like, it's more about the infidelity than it's actually about privacy. Well, yeah. Because privacy, they don't care about at all. No, not particularly. Like, you have to give all your health check to your, like, for example, employer. Like, the health check every yeah, year. Yeah. They see all the data. It's like, privacy? No? Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's a big no-no in, in Germany. If you need a health, mm. health check, you need it for certain jobs. But it never ends up at your employer. Mm, mm. they just get like yeah it's okay or it's not okay but yeah, they never get the report that's it and mm. another thing is because we don't like to be filmed in germany as well so we uh, have really. more or less the same issue but for different reasons we just really don't want to be in a video <laughs> <laughs> because we <laughs> value our privacy so a lot of americans normally tell us how weird it is that if you hold up a camera like everyone runs away huh. in germany mm. and in america the other way around yeah i think in the uk we don't really, I, I guess we don't we really the care same. in the uk we don't we don't really mind i guess we're closer <laughs> to america in that way maybe maybe yeah so you can get angry people because my dad is very talented in filming, I don't know, random stuff and uh, people get angry at him for filming something <laughs> and then someone is in the shot <laughs> and that person gets angry. God. I'm like, yeah, sorry, <laughs> we, we plan to film that. <laughs> Okay, then I think I, I just want to stay a bit at this bureaucracy stuff. I don't know how interested other people are in that, but because, because I know in Germany as well, and we normally speak German, so I think it fits. We all yes. have a lot of bureaucracy sorry for, here as well. And I'm, Sorry for the extra challenge today of, uh, of not being able to speak German. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think we both need it a lot in our lives, so it's not so bad. <laughs> Uh, normally our podcast evolves around us not being able to remember German words. Mm. So last time, that um, is very much true. <laughs> we couldn't figure out what dictionary means in German. Uh, we really, yeah. I was Jisho, Jisho. Was like, oh, Jisho, yeah, but we couldn't remember the German word. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to look it up and like the translation bag would be like just um, words book. Oh, right. And yeah. I read it. <laughs> And and I thought, oh no, I could I could have remembered that. Oh, <laughs> it is pretty easy. <laughs> so that's our podcast most of the time. Yeah, I mean, usually Ella is okay, fine in German, but uh, my life is like very strange. Like I have moved to Norway for five years, and then I've moved to Japan three years ago. So oh wow, and you're in? It's not very much thinking straight. You're in then. Osaka, right? <laughs> yes. Wow, lucky. It's, it's a pretty cool city, I think. <laughs> but although, I guess people have mixed experiences. No, I, I do like Osaka. I also have never had bad experience in Tokyo. Though. Oh, cool. So for me, it's like every, everybody is like, oh, Tokyo, they are so mean. They are hmm. a bit more rushed. Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm not sure about I mean, that. Yeah. But okay. I've never found people in Tokyo to be mean, but I found that people in Osaka are more outgoing and fun. Like if you're in the street in Osaka, it's mm. much more likely to have somebody just like strike up a conversation with you and just talk to you, um, which I like, you know, it's cool. I've met a lot more interesting characters on nights out in Osaka than I have in Tokyo from my memory. So yeah, I always want to live there, characters, but, but I never yeah. will. So well done. You've beaten <laughs> me in that regard. Oh, why not? Maybe at some point. I so. doubt it. I can't <laughs> see it happening now, but I... Uh, I'll have to dream about that. It'll be a dream that will never come true. Maybe because Dari is so used to Osaka mm. that she's not really recognizing the difference. So that was my theory. It's possible. A few yeah. episodes ago, because you're always, always only vis visiting Tokyo. So it's always hard to tell the difference. I don't know. Um, yes, bureaucracy, because we have it here, and I I don't know much about it because I'm not a YouTuber, but from what I hear, bureaucracy is really, really awful in Germany when it comes to YouTube. Mm. So is is there anything you need to um, remember in Japan? For example, we have like very strict rules when it comes to sponsorships, how you need to advertise it, that it is a sponsorship, and it's like really detailed and complex, and I have no idea what you need to do to do the sponsorships on your channel so 
the bureaucracy around doing sponsorships, I guess, pretty easy, really. Somebody goes, do you want to put Tokyo Treat in the video? You go, yes. And then they give you a number, and then off you go. But, I mean, like, you've obviously you've got to, if you do a sponsorship, you've got to, like, say that it's sponsored and stuff on YouTube. Things like that, but... Is that a YouTube rule or is it a Japanese rule as well? It's a good question. I think it's a Japan rule, but YouTube have made it a kind of a, a policy across the world, which makes sense, right? Ever since those British YouTubers mm -hmm. made the video when they ate some Oreo biscuits in some sort of challenge and it was secretly a sponsor, I think a lot of people have been quite wary about it. And nobody likes to feel like we've been misled um, by a YouTuber who's like put loads of sponsor products in their videos. And I remember seeing it a lot. Like five, six years ago, I remember watching loads of YouTube videos and then there'd be a YouTuber like, wow, I love my watch. It's a really great waterproof ergonomical watch. You should definitely buy one. It's great. Yeah. Why haven't you bought my imaginary watch? So it's nice to be beyond that, I guess. But um, I don't really do a lot of sponsorship stuff. I do more... I kind of work with travel companies and stuff, but it's I don't really kind of call it sponsor i don't see it as a sponsor because they don't tell me where to go they sort of give me some budget and then let me go wherever i want and sort of cover a prefecture um for example i've got a video coming up mm. in akita prefecture with my good friend riotaro and i think we've got some sort of budget almost like a subsidy from the akita government and then we have to sort of find interesting places to sort of promote the prefecture so that's my kind of thing um and i've generally been able to rule out doing a lot of sponsor stuff because thankfully i've got the the abroad in japan patreon thing so uh, lucky in that regard um because in germany it's I, i really don't know the rules but at one point some creators actually did say okay that's an advertisement because i'm going to link my friend here it's like if mm. um i don't know if you would make a picture of natsuki mm. and he would need to link you as advertisement because you are a youtuber and making money with that so it it gone huh. that far in germany yeah, that's for a bit too far. advertisement too far. that's a bit too far it is yeah that's that's too far i think the the point where it, it needs to it needs to be about like deception i think if you're lying to your audience mm. or being deceptive that's the real problem right yeah where well, it's not clear Yeah, it went to some point that uh, some of my friends, like or like friends of friends, actually tagged all their pictures on Instagram with ad if there was any product on it. It wasn't sponsored or anything, but you mm. cannot God. tell. So a lot of people were super afraid Bloody of hell. doing that mistake, even though they have no followers or anything. Wow. Yeah, because we have a very big suing mach machinery here. It's uh, mm. relatively easy to sue in Germany. It's even a funny phrase. Um, I don't know how to say it in English. I think you can say something like, I just filed my complaint. Huh. Yeah, it's, so it's easy to sue. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's really easy to sue. So a lot of um, lawyers just suing you to make money in, for no reason. For example, if you have a product in your Instagram, even though you like have no followers or whatever. Jesus, that's awful. <laughs> it's terrible. It's, it's just, I just wanted to know if this is like really a law or just something you want to hear. Because, of course, that's the thing I think. Um, I just want to know is this sponsored are you using this for 10 years or maybe three years because i actually started to listen to some whatever they do creators mm. i i learned that's uh insult as well <laughs> but uh, I, i stick with creators uh if they say all right i'm using this for 10 years and i like it then i am influenced by that right right yeah. and trying it out it's a good point Yeah, I, that's why I, I guess I, yeah, I guess I'm very careful about what I feature in my videos as a result, right? You don't want to get into that sort of territory. So it's just not fun. It takes the fun out of YouTube, doesn't it? Worrying about things all the time. Yeah, that's uh, one one thing I thought is since you have the Patreon, you're not so dependent on YouTube and the sponsorships and so mm. on. Because you, I know you talked a lot about something I can't renounce. I'm trying it. <laughs> Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. <laughs> entrepreneurship <laughs> it's a really hard word um but you never started your business even so it seemed you were obsessed for a while back in britain with starting your own business mm. or do you have a company now um I've, why did that never happen why did that never happen well i mean i don't know i guess it's all a bit complicated isn't it <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah maybe i should have done that i don't know i never really had much of a plan when i did all this it just sort of mm 
just happened i guess really i did i did used to want all sorts of companies and things but i remember when i was 18 my dream was to run a business but i didn't know what the business was ever going to be and i my image was just like running an office and having people there but again i didn't know what the business was going to be but now i've got this successful kind of media uh thing going on we've got the abroad japan channel and the podcast but uh i have no staff i don't have my wonderful imaginary office it's just me and a few people that help although i did recently get an editor which i should have done a long time ago and that's my advice to anyone who becomes a youtuber get an editor <laughs> once you reach like 100 200,000 subscribers definitely get an editor i regret not doing it sooner i could have had a lot the, the channel could have been a lot bigger if i had i think mm. Yeah, but I I can understand that it's always hard to give up mm. control, especially if you enjoy editing and you like like the style of editing. Yeah. Even though if you find someone who's actually better at editing, but it's editing in a different style, it's it's not helping. Yeah, I think I was worried about that, like losing the identity of uh, of the channel a mm. bit by not being the editor. So I've been kind of teaching, training my editor what to do and how to sort of make it like a broad in Japan. Although I don't really know what what that is, what that involves, to be honest. Using the same four songs over and over. That's the Abroad in Japan channel. <laughs> well, I think it just works out if you just say what you dislike mm. or what you would do differently. Yeah. And eventually, I think you will get it. Yeah. Even though there's not a big plan. Exactly. Um, yes, so sort of your channel is a business even. Mm. If you don't see it that way. Yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is. I see it more of a, of a brand than a business and i don't mm. i have i'm very careful but with the brand you know i want the abroad in japan sort of brand to stand for quality and good production quality and uh, comedy and uh, you know yeah good quality good comedy videos that make you smile that should be the tagline for the abroad <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Oof. like if like all the japanese companies also mm, make you smile like if i hear that <laughs> one more time that's what i want i want that tagline <laughs> that's my my almost that's not my greatest issue with japan what i'm pretending uh that everything needs to be cute and funny mm. and smile mm. and like the roadblocks need to be a cute little giraffe it's oh, not yeah. just a cone it's, <laughs> it's just too much for me <laughs> <laughs> oh all the lights like when we were driving in japan yes. like all the lights everywhere it's not like some information no 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 it's like a light show <laughs> yeah like in tunnels you get this uh, rotating lights and i'm always steering towards them because they're so interesting <laughs> oh so it's God. like the opposite of what they should be the it's like, oh, all the lights. <laughs> yeah it is and if there was a roadblock for like construction, there's like not only one board telling you construction. No, there's like an a, like light a worker that is animated to like wave a flag. It's all lights, and then yeah. there's like these rotation lights, other blinking lights, stop lights. Like, oh, okay. I love it. I like the way they have the um, they have these like robots <laughs> that wave a flag. I don't know if you've seen it on the highways yeah. in Japan because uh, we have. They yeah. need that for some reason. Waving robot man. Yeah, <laughs> and. As we were traveling through the north by car, um, we had a lot of blocked ways. Like it's, it was only only one way, right? And uh, you had the, all the slides, and I was standing in front of it, and I thought that is so too much <laughs> <laughs> with all the blinking lights and the waving robot <laughs> and like an animated robot and so on. Uh, yeah. And the other yeah, issue oh, was steering back to the left side. It always felt like dying a bit, <laughs> driving on the right uh, side because course, the left yeah. side was blocked. And then the, the block is over. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want to yes, do this. Suddenly, when you're <laughs> overtaking, you suddenly feel like something is right. Like, yeah. correct. <laughs> and then, oh no, and you have to go back. I didn't think about <laughs> that. For you, I guess it's like driving on the wrong the wrong side of the road and it's all quite scary. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually not like that a, difficult. A, yeah, it, it, it's not that difficult, but the beginning is pretty dangerous. Like, um, we started off, like, she didn't have her translated um, thing yet, but yeah. I had it already, so I started driving. But that was the first time, like, both of us sat in a car <laughs> on the left side of the road. And um, so, of course, like, the first turn went okay. Like, we had some other issues as well, but the first turn went okay. <laughs> next turn, next yeah. turn was like, I, I wanted to go left. <laughs> Yeah, left. So left means a small turn, small, not big turn. But like, I was like, you know, if you drive on the right side, it's mean you're, you're taking your like a long turn, turn yeah. type. Oh, God. And she she was like, no, you're going for the big turn. 
left. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> terrifying. Because I already saw how sh how she was steering that she was going to <laughs> to the wrong yes, side. Yes, yes. Like you can feel how you're going to the wrong side. It sounds like yeah, a but, traffic but, accident waiting to happen. <laughs> And, Absolutely. And it was in the middle of Osaka, and I still don't know how this employer actually allowed us yeah, to drive the off his uh, Like, the confidence party. of that man. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, gave us, they gave us the car keys and pushed us in the car. It's like, go, go, go. It's oh, like, God. I, it, it, like, I drive manual usually, and that was automatic. It shouldn't be a problem. But for me, it was. So we had automatic problems. <laughs> and uh, it was a hybrid as well. So she wasn't, I'm trying a hybrid as well. So I don't have issues with my motor not running, uh, but right. she was so irritated, oh, uh, annoyed by it. And she, and it was <laughs> really a lot. And I thought, oh no, I don't have my translation yet. That must have I can't been drive. terrifying. <laughs> so we, we actually drove to the translation center to get hers. But uh, I mean, after a few There is turns, video footage of that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> and so at some point I was screaming at her like, Put the camera away! I need your eyes on the street! <laughs> and I was laughing so hard because she was trying to kill us. <laughs> Good God. Sounds like the most yeah. dangerous road trip yeah, ever. But it's <laughs> uh, yeah, it was fine it after was. a few turns. But I yeah. think I didn't have so much is issues with sticking on the left side of the road. But we both, have, like everyone has issues mm. with... Yeah. Your car, the, the like your how the size distances. is, mm. because you're so used to the distance mm. being different that you're not driving left, but like really hard left. Yeah, you drive really, really <laughs> left. <laughs> so in, in in Japan, there's these like uh, what's I called these um, like for the water next to the street. Yeah, I know. We we well the I informally called gaijin traps like foreigner traps because a lot <laughs> yeah, of foreigners just fall down them. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I know a lot of people that fell like fall down them. Driving down them would be the or end of your car. Terrifying. Yes. So she was really terrified of me driving too far left for good reasons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in, in the garden trip. And we, that, that was freaking me out a lot. <laughs> and I said, could you drive a little bit more to the right, please? And she <laughs> said, no, it's perfectly fine because she was used to the other distances. Yeah, yeah. It looks good. It looks correct. And then you're like, oh, no, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. Oh, and God. she might have realized that after we... Um, Gently struck one lantern with our yeah, back like, mirror. So you, the, the, the mirror hit the lantern like very, very tiny, but it's like, oh shit. Oh. <laughs> that is actually very And close. I was like, I told you, you're driving too far left. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> Terrified. But, yeah. Yeah. So the trick we learned is like, if you ever need to drive on the right side, so the opposite side, use the side mirror. The mm. side mirror tells you how far you're away from the middle line. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <Good> oh, <laughs> God. I won't be getting in a car with you anytime soon, I'm afraid. No, now it's fine. Now we actually both pretty you've stable. I've just spent five minutes telling me of the horrors of your driving. <laughs> yeah, that was like the first, was first five minutes of us uh, <laughs> driving <laughs> on the left side. Smashing the lanterns of Japan. Mm. <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah. All right, where did we even get there? How? I don't know. Driving in Japan. Driving in Japan. Media overload. Yeah, it's our second episode, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who understands German. Uh, I think something with uh, starting your own business. What does this mm. have to do with driving? I don't know. Uh, starting a business will drive you mad. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, then, oh, well, but it's still a um, transition of some sort because we now told you how much was going wrong with us driving on the left side for the first time in the middle of Osaka hmm. because that's really the, the, the point where you want to start driving on the left side of the road. In a very busy street. Like yeah, city. don't recommend it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, what's going wrong? So Because I know you sometimes uh, are saying that if you really dislike a video, you're not uploading it. Just... Has this changed or are you still like very much um, thinking, no, I don't like it, I won't upload it? Because I can imagine there is some pressure on you to upload videos. I don't remember the last time I didn't upload a video that I didn't like, to be honest. I did do a video with my good friend Natsuki where we went to a Japanese like desert island and then I wasn't sure if I wanted to upload it or not because my videos, I always try to have a point, an educational point, right? You've got to get that balance mm -hmm. right. 50% educational, 50% entertainment and with that video Super. it was like no educational <laughs> value it's just natsuki and i went to a desert island natsuki wanted to look for treasure and then he dressed up like a pirate <laughs> and we just just like tore the island apart trying to look for some treasure 
and it was ridiculous. And so I haven't posted that yet. I will one day soon. But that's an example of a video that I was like, eh, I don't know if I should post it or not. I'll just leave it there on the hard drive and come back to that later on. Um, but at this point, I don't think I would make a video unless I knew it was definitely going up. You know, I don't think there's any harm, though, in taking down a video that you're not happy with or you didn't really, you know, mm. that you weren't happy with like, many years later. I mean, it's a learning curve after all. I did toy around with videos a lot, mm. but what I figured out was I do love presenting, I do love editing, but the filming part, I might enjoy that if it's like the only thing I would need to do. Mm. But every three things. So I started to hate filming. <laughs> and, and that's bad because my filming is so bad, so editing will be worse as well mm. so you have bad footage mm. so you don't enjoy editing anymore because i figured out i sometimes because i'm just i'm just technically interested in stuff so i'm trying to edit from time to time mm. <laughs> and if i just use stuff from someone else it's so much better and so much more fun it's quite But interesting at least you usually have a plan like i do enjoy filming random shit that doesn't make any sense <laughs> yeah and then you're uh, dying trying to edit it <laughs> yeah. yeah so that's why i never edit <laughs> no there's nothing there's nothing worse than trying to edit something that you know is bad and you have to spend loads of time trying to make it into something good you know which i've had to do a lot of times but Yeah, it's a lot more work, right? And I always have audio issues. I don't know. It's my <laughs> curse. Because I'm, I really would want to have good audio and I never pulled it off. It's so really, really annoying. What do you do wrong? I, well, the, here I have like an Insta360 and I just think it dislikes my microphone as well. So it's not very well for having an external uh, microphone. The internal is awful as well. So yeah. I normally don't use this microphone here right. for filming. But even that, even on the podcast, I managed, or my uh, program somehow managed to uh, use the microphone of a camera. And that... One time, yeah. In one time, that podcast sounds so awful. Oh, God, yeah. It's, uh, yeah I don't know how I always, <laughs> always, always manage to put it... Audio quality is everything. It's more important than video, often. True. You know, a good voiceover can save a terrible video. So, you know, audio is really important. I did that once... I actually voiced over myself like once or twice because it was so awful. <laughs> and it was pretty good. Almost not noticeable. Really. Well, for you and other people. Yeah, because, because I'm bad with audio. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. German friends are like um, not, oh, great, you, you, you made a video, let's have a look at it. But they're like giving you that, a list of the, the <laughs> things that are wrong on your first video. And you're like, yeah, I noticed. Thanks. <laughs> One person, just the first thing he brought back was, here, I've made a video. And he said, the audio is off. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's always the first thing that I, I, I notice know. about a video. Audio, you know. Yeah, true. And I, I actually don't know where I was going with that. But uh, speaking of your humor coming back, I, I just remembered. So I rarely remember when I decide to like a channel. But I remember it with your channel because it was a really old video. So I was, I think, I actually wanted to look up things to do in Osaka. Which I find, if you start with a topic, it's kind of hard to get into like Japan information. And it's you either find the wrong information <laughs> or too much. Mm. or Especially if you search in German. German that's why our podcast uh, is in true. German in the first place. It's not so much. So I ended up on YouTube, which I didn't use for a long time and i tried to find things to do in osaka you didn't have a wii u back then but you were like persistently in my timeline huh. <laughs> and i thought all right <laughs> i'm clicking <laughs> on his face and uh, and i i think i was watching a few videos and couldn't figure out if you're just uh f yeah really full of yourself or if you're <laughs> making fun but i i don't know you said one key <laughs> phrase which was so over the top that made me laugh so hard that i decided that i really liked your channel and it's, it was a really old one i think it was something about a book you will write a book about i don't know oh write a book how you conquer the world i don't i don't know it's a really, really do you remember the video one. what it was I might need to look it up. You were in your first flat back then. Wow, that's a long so time it's ago. Really, really old. Very long time ago. I forgot. I used to. I used to remember every video I'd ever made, but I've reached the point now where I, I've lost. I've I've forgotten like the early days, because it's been like nine years now. 
Um, I think no. The important thing is right. I try on video. If you you know if you get into YouTube and present or whatever, it's much more fun if you take on a kind of a persona. If you become something like like you're almost mm. acting a bit. Like in real life, I'm relatively normal, unremarkable, like nothing special. But when I got the camera rolling, I'm able to be more evil, more sarcastic, more monstrous. And that's that's a lot more fun, you know. I could probably get more views if I was nicer and less opinionated, but uh, where's the fun in that, you know? Really? Yeah. I think the space, the spice of your channel is like all the sarcasm. Maybe. Well, for the people that watch it, it is, yeah. But if I, you know, if I call it Chris's happy fucking Japan, and, oh, Japan's so good, oh, yeah, sushi, mmm, delicious, Ooh. you know, it could probably attract a lot more people who wouldn't be put off by my snarky cynical sarcastic undertones but yeah but where would the, where would the fun be in that yeah i'm always forgetting that some people just don't get sarcasm or irony or anything no else, they don't so. <laughs> yeah a lot of you know a lot of people think i'm serious and in, in a lot of my videos and that's always bad but you know you just gotta be who you want to be yeah then it's not the people who should you watch mm, your videos mm. i think to be bold. <laughs> I That's think right. it's maybe uh, the horrors of Japanese English textbooks or Japanese three essential phrase you should know. And it's one of the first you still have on your ah, channel. Right. So it's really, really I do like the horror. I remember the horror. I can send one. it to you if I find it. The horror one was good because I was just making fun of a Japanese English textbook. Anyone that's ever taught English in Japan yeah. knows how bad those Japanese English textbooks are. And uh, it was quite cathartic and rewarding to destroy one in a video in 10 minutes. That was fun. <laughs> I remember that video well. Eight years later. I think mm -hmm. my first video of you was the one uh, about learning Japanese in six months. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. It actually gave me a lot of hope. Like, I think at that point, I, I'm i not even sure what my uh, life was at that point. But um, the, at the moment, I wanted to go to Japan for a PhD exchange. Mm. I remembered that video and I was like, maybe I can actually learn some Japanese. Not like so much, but <laughs> it's possible to learn it in six months, right? <laughs> yeah, like, I, I hate the title of that video. It sounds really sleazy, isn't it? Like, s becoming fluent in Japan, six six months, whatever. Like, it just seems a bit sleazy and cheap, but I stand by everything I said in that video. I do think you could become conversationally fluent at Japanese if you were like... Again, I think I, I get my. I made the the comparison that if someone had a gun to your head and you had no choice, you absolutely yes. had to become <laughs> uh, conversationally fluent in six months. You would have the time to memorize the words to do that with some time left to spare. I think it was like four months. I said you could do it in, but luckily none of us have a gun to our head, so we don't have to. We don't have to get to that point. But sometimes I wish <laughs> because next week is JLPT. Oh, which one? <laughs> and. <laughs> I'm not. Is it the? I'm sorry. taking it slow. Like N five, N four, three, two, one. Nah, N four. Oh. Like yeah, I'm I'm somewhere N four, but um, yeah. So it might or might not work. Well, if you get it, you've got one more JLPT than I do. I took N two like four years ago, and I failed it, and then I was like, oh, I can't be bothered again. But I mean, I don't really need. You know, I don't really need a JLPT qualification but i kind of want one i feel like i'd i'd feel like a dickhead mm. if i'd left japan and i hadn't got like a jail and jlpt exam really i feel like i need one but yeah. just have the time to study it takes a lot of time to study japanese yeah right? i mean same same situation i don't need it but it would be nice also mm. i would like to speak it i would like to be able to have a good conversation which is not possible yet <laughs> <laughs> oh keep it up good luck with that test okay <laughs> You know, Thanks. like your context has been, because she is an academica and changed to Japan to a university and everyone mm. is speaking English there. Mm, it's not like mm. there are a lot of Japanese people around you per default. Like you choose mm. to not speak Japanese or choose to uh, get foreign friends. It's just the environment. So Everyone is just international at some point. Well, I mean, you already speak two languages, right? So that's pretty cool. You already... Three. Three? As so she's speaking three languages, three. not me. <laughs> what, what language? Is, what, what else? Yeah, technically. <laughs> technically four, I uh, think. Technically five, like if we can't Japanese, because um, yeah, of course, German and English. 
Uh, I've lived in Norway. I speak Norwegian, which is my like third most fluent, which wow. I, I would call somewhat fluent. I have learned French for wow. <laughs> seven years in school, Good God. which is <laughs> okay. And then now it's Japanese. Wow. Well, <laughs> that's and a lot more languages than I can speak. She has a doctor title. <laughs> And a doctor. <laughs> Which is a bit annoying. Dr. Dari. Because I don't have a doctor title yet. <laughs> yet. It's but, but I will have one eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that matters. Wish I was a doctor. Dr. Chris. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no titles. I don't know why I started it, to be honest. But I well, I just push through it. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, it doesn't help for anything, but no. it's nice to have. <laughs> so we both computer scientists. We met at our master degree, and mm. um, so it's not p relatively pointless to do a doctor, a PhD in, in computer science. But for somehow we yeah. decided we we wanted to do that. I do actually remember the the <laughs> night where we decided to do our PhDs. So we had our master degrees and. They weren't exactly bad. <laughs> and we were sitting there on my sofa and thought, okay, what now? What now? And we both... <laughs> what now? Yeah, and we both said, <laughs> what now? like, okay, um, I think at the, at the same time I said, I think I would be a good uh, animal keeper. And she said, I always <laughs> wanted to be an a animal doctor. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, want, I always wanted to study veterinary, veterinary med medicine. I don't know why I never did. <laughs> and I wanted to become an animal keeper suddenly. So we decided the natural thing. Okay, we're doing our PhDs now. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, the natural next step is just continue what you keep doing and do not change it to what you actually want to do. <laughs> <laughs> One day you'll be a veterinarian. I believe in you. You can do it. Yeah, in I Japan. have a feeling I need to study for that. After the JLP two, <laughs> yes. Once you've got N4 out of the way, then you can be a veterinarian. One step yeah, at a time. Yeah, I guess might not be enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's let's keep it positive. <laughs> yeah, so I can be the veter veterinarian and you come and then we make you like a big palace for <laughs> pets. A big palace. Right. A palace for pets. I'm the keeper then at your veterinarian <laughs> palace for <laughs> pets. <laughs> In Japan, the only the only place where animals are treated nicely <laughs> in an organization. Not that, oh God, I meant like organizationally, because zoos aren't very really known for being nice to animals mm. in Japan mm. or Japan like dog cafes or nice to cat animals. coffees. Lord, That's what I meant. I, I didn't <laughs> want to say that everyone who owns a pet in Japan <laughs> is evil. <laughs> All right. But um, yeah, coming back to you um to your channel because i do remember that you once um i was in japan so i was texting you something mm. i think i was jealous about your picture on the swing haha <laughs> i remember that on the, on the <laughs> you remember swing? that yes yeah swing yeah. you know like really? uh, for ch for children it might be not even on your instagram it might be on uh, yeah i remember that i remember that place yeah Fukushima. Yeah, mm. exactly. And that's what I wanted to um, get to because you said, uh, don't go there. It went so much went wrong. How much is going wrong? I mean, that went wrong. So that vid, that was the day we went to film the Fukushima nuclear disaster documentary. And for some reason, Ryotaro had this idea of putting in an art gallery, some sort of weird art gallery, not far from the disaster zone. I wasn't for it. I didn't want to go. And we went there, and the guy that ran it was very not nice. Like he, he was very angry, um, and just we he shouted at us for about fifty minutes, and it was so awkward because uh, Riotaro had a guy. We had a guy with us. He was helping us around the Fukushima disaster zone, and he was driving the car, and he drove into the car park for the art gallery. And there was a sign that he missed saying, don't park your car in the art gallery car park. And it was so petty and ridiculous. But anyway, we went up, met the guy, and he was really nice. And then he just switched after 10 minutes and was like, oh, but you parked in my fucking car park, didn't you? Didn't you see the sign? Didn't you see the sign that says no cars? Uh, and it went on for 50 minutes. And I was just standing there like, is this happening? Is this real? And it was so weird. And it's such a ridiculous story that I need to write down one day and talk about. But I, I've, it's so so strange. Like in the UK, if someone did that for 50 minutes, there'd be a fight. But in Japan, weirdly, when there's like an altercation, people just stand there and take it. I remember standing there with Ryotaro, 
while the art gallery guy just shouted at the at our driver man and I was just like looking at Riotro like what is going on here and then after like 50 minutes of shouting at us he went alright let's go and look at a swing and then we went to the swing and I sat on the <laughs> fucking swing and so that's why I was, I was like yeah don't go there because he might shout at you if you drive into his car park and crash into his fence or something it's so weird uh, things go wrong we had a similar <laughs> experience in i'm not mentioning the place but um at a car park at, at a, a car, car park, park. <laughs> exactly so my, my brothers do still smoke and they were with, with us and my brother didn't see the non-smoking sign oh. so uh, he smoked and then someone approached us and was angry with us hmm. as well and as he pointed at the direction of the signs. Uh, my brother immediately put out his cigarette and was about to put it in, I think it was an empty bottle or something, like in the car, in somewhere. Yeah. And then this guy yelled at my brother that he shouldn't uh, put it away, like yeah. someone yeah. put it on the ground or let it fall or something. And my He was so adamant about that, like, don't throw yeah. away, don't litter, don't... He wasn't about to uh. do anything like that. Yeah, and so he, he was already with, with bottle in hand trying to put his cigarette <laughs> away. The, the person kept yelling to one point... We thought he wanted us that my brother th threw the cigarette in the plants or something because yeah he because of course the English or Japanese I can't even remember I was crappy like yeah, I yeah, couldn't yeah, sure. have a good communication anyway I was like what does he what does he actually want does he want us to throw it like at that point because he kept on going it's like Jesus. what are we still doing wrong how old was the man <laughs> how old was this guy. 50, it's always older people. Like yeah, the guy 50, that the guy 60, that shouted at us for fifty minutes was in his late fifties or sixties, and uh, yeah, senior people mm -hmm. can be a bit stupid. And, uh, in Japan, they get a bit like because of the whole hierarchy thing and age, and you know, older people are to be treated like gods. It's uh, it gets a bit weird. Like when I often rewind to that car park fifty minutes. And I was really angry because I was like, let's go and film the nuclear disaster that we came here to film. Let's not get shouted at 50 minutes. But we stood there and took it. And I feel like I want to go back in time and be like, we said sorry. Fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself. We said sorry like 100 times. <laughs> What do you want us to do? And there is that. Like, if you do something wrong in Japan, they'll, you, you're supposed to stand there and kind of get shouted at for a long period of time. It's like part of the sort of punishment, right? You know, when when students did bad things at school when they were naughty, they went they were brought into the staff room to shout it at for about twenty five to thirty minutes. Whereas in the UK, it'd be like, "Oi, don't oh do God. it again, or you're going to get detention." Now go back and do something. Whereas in Japan, it's like that. It's almost like this torturous, long twenty thirty minute process of humiliation. So that's what you experienced with your cigarette. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very Great. interesting part of the culture. <laughs> Uh, I think it only goes bad in Germany if you talk back, like right. if someone is shouting at you for yeah. some ridiculous reason and just so, uh, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. So you, the wind is completely out mm. of their sails, so they don't know what to do and just walk away. So that always works here. Yeah. Almost always. <laughs> I mean, idiots are everywhere. True. Okay, so, and with the Hokkaido trip, what was going wrong in the Hokkaido trip? Is there still a lot you need to plan around If you're making videos, is still mm. going a lot wrong, or what is working, what's not working? I think so. I went to Hokkaido, f I did a trip to the most northern point in Japan, uh, Wakanai, it's called, yeah. with my good friend Pete. And yeah, a lot of things went wrong. Like on the first day, we went to this abandoned city that had been destroyed by a volcano, like the Pompeii of Japan. It was going to be amazing. We got there, and it was under like four meters of snow, and it was completely <laughs> inaccessible. And there was like a man at a museum there, and I was like, I really want to see the city. And he was like, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. And I just... So that went out the window. Then I got to the hotel after like five hours of driving, and we opened the door. And it was like this Airbnb kind of style hostel place. And there was like a there's a kitchen downstairs. It was like a restaurant downstairs and a uh, a hotel above. And we went in and we we're like, hi, we've got a room for tonight. And he went, no, you don't. I went, yeah, we do. And he went, no, you don't. And we we're like, oh, fuck's sake, really? And so we had to spend like 25 minutes convincing this man that we were definitely staying at his <laughs> his hostel. And uh, eventually he was like, oh yeah, maybe you are. I'm like, Brilliant. But, uh, yeah, the really bad thing that went wrong was I ran out of fuel while I was driving, something I've never done, something we all worry about, and I did it in a really stupid place. Like, I was in the middle of the mountains in Hokkaido, in the middle of nowhere, 
and I ran out of fuel because I forgot to refuel. And at that point, I dropped off my good American friend Pete at the airport so he could fly to Tokyo, and I had to drive the car back for four hours to Hakodate, to the car rental place. But I'd, in my hurry to get back, in my excitement, I'd forgotten to refuel the car. And so it ran out of fuel in the most like remote part of Hokkaido. And it was horrible. It was just the most unpleasant thing. That moment when you realise your car's about to run out of fuel is a terrible thing. It's like, oh, fuck. And the nearest petrol station was like 40 kilometres away. It wasn't a nice nice experience. It's like a nightmare. It's horrible. Ugh. Yeah, what, what did you do then? Uh, I pushed the car. For forty kilometers, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's Good with my workout. sheer strength. I pushed the car across a mountain range. Either that, or I called up the Japanese roadside assistance people. And this poor man came out. He had to drive for like an hour and a half from Sapporo, and he brought a little bucket filled with <laughs> unleaded fuel. And he'd drive all the way out and like poured it into my car, and then he'd drive all the way a back bucket? to Sapporo. Yeah, like a little. Well, like a like, little petrol tank. It wasn't like a literally, literally a bucket full of petrol. But like he had like a little, little gasoline tank and he sort of poured it into the car and then went off again. So he must have hated me. A three-hour round trip because I forgot to fuel the car. Disaster. But it will never happen again. I learned my lesson. Never again. Ugh. So embarrassing. Yeah, we have a, a club here. ADAC, which is for if you have issues with the, with your car, mm. all sorts of issues. But if you forget to fuel, you need to pay. So you normally pay a yeah. yearly fee. Yeah. And everything is covered from like getting your car somewhere. But if you forget to fuel, I think you need to pay them actually yeah, because yeah. it's also, so stupid. You're a hazard. It, it's stupid and mm. you're a hazard for the others. So you do have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it must be a Hokkaido thing to not get into your Airbnb. <laughs> Because mm. we had uh, in such an experience oh, really? as well that we couldn't ring up the, the guy. So oh, God. That was interesting as well. Bloody Hokkaido. But he came eventually. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, after he actually yeah. came, it was all, all, all right. Like, But it's such a weird experience. Like, yeah. Do you want to tell the story? <laughs> I don't know. Do I need to? It's, it's <laughs> relatively short. So I, I drove. I think we were a little bit late because we were on mm. Hell's Valley and we stayed somewhere uh, really in the middle, too. remote. Mm. Yes. And we stayed somewhere very remote. And I drove like the whole day. It was already dark. And I remember that we should wait at a Lawson or some other convenience store, 7 Eleven, whatever. Mm. And he said we couldn't ring him up because uh, we should ring him up so that he can could bring us to the Airbnb. And I said, okay, Dari, I'm so tired. Do you want to drive? And then he came eventually. I think he was a bit tipsy in his car and said, <laughs> all right, venture with me to our yeah, Airbnb. So, oh like, we were standing there. You have to imagine, like our car was standing like with yeah. four people, right? We were waiting. Uh, we informed him that we are late, but he also let us wait. And it was a really weird situation. And we had to text him on this like Airbnb app. And then eventually he came like with like, like mm, a lot of speed on the parking space next to the car. Like, okay, let's go, follow me and drove off really fast. So we drove off really <laughs> fast. And then he's like, Driving and stopping. Oh, God. And we're like, huh? It was Why? just across <laughs> the road. <laughs> it was oh, just across Lord. the road. The place. We, we could have just what stayed at this damn convenience store and in the parking lot and walked there. Like, it was 20 yeah, meters. 50 at best. Airbnb. Literally, you could see the place. Oh, the Airbnb was nice, actually. <laughs> Worst <host. laughs> Yeah. But the they, guy was just a bit yeah. weird. <laughs> oh, God. It's funny, though. Every time you film in Hokkaido, you can't see things because they're covered in snow. I do remember yeah. the lavender field yes, as well. The lavender, the rolling lavender fields of... Where was it? Um, what's the place in the middle of Hokkaido called? Uh, oh, I can't remember. But yeah, no, every names. time I go, it's all, something always goes wrong. But I do love Hokkaido and I do have a lot of great memories there. And uh, mm. I do think it's one of the most amazing places in Japan, whether it's winter or summer, there's always something to do. And uh, yeah, it's a great it's a great place, great island. And it was the first place in our trip where it wasn't so hot. Yeah, yeah, in the summer. And we were there. <laughs> bearable, right? Uh, beginning of September and it was so mm. hot in Tokyo it was still so hot in Sendai and in Amori and as we finally 
went to Hokkaido and I think the first few hours were hot as well, but in the middle mm. of Hokkaido at night, it finally cooled down. It was such a relief after <laughs> two weeks of just dying, <laughs> seeing things. We actually walked up Yamadera Temple in this temperature. It wasn't <laughs> very nice. Ah. My heart, so all the stairs to Yamadera Temple. Oh, wow, really? Yamadera? In in the heat and... <laughs> Yeah, we, we went to a few places and I do remember that my pulse at one point said, yeah, you're going to rest now or you're going to die. <laughs> I mean, I, so climbed, really I had, climbed it in winter. I had to stand there for five minutes. I climbed it like two or three months ago in winter and that was hard enough, let alone in summer. Like, that's, Yamadera is brutal. It's just, beautiful. Yeah, that yeah, is it's true. Beautiful. It's, uh, I can't believe that's just hundred stairs or was it thousand, thousand stairs, right? <laughs> Feels like a thousand. thousand. stairs, I think. <laughs> I think it actually is. Probably, I yeah. Think yeah I think it is. Yeah. is much easier. <laughs> I think that's the title, like the other title of the place. Okay, but it never really happened that so much was going wrong in the past that you needed to done the whole video, or can you still work around it? I mean, often, you know, when things go wrong, that's where the comedy is, right? I think when things go wrong, that's when life gets interesting. Like I... Uh, in the very most recent abroad in Japan video, I think I rode I rode a horse and the horse like wanted to kill me, and I had to get off the horse and it was awful. But like if it you know that was kind of funny and interesting. If the horse had been nice and I'd rode the horse, it would have been boring if it had all gone well, you know. So sometimes when things go wrong, that's where the good stuff is. That's where the excitement is, the laughter, the comedy. You know, it's 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 just it's more natural, right, for things to go mm. wrong. Yeah, that's true. And I feel like people are more engaged when things go wrong because they always want to help out. Yeah. Because, because I saw a lot of comments on your video suggesting, so, oh God, I can't pronounce this word, trying to tell you what you should do better the next time if you're riding a horse. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. Which was nice. I think I think the horse just was just... I remember I got on the horse and he, it looked, it turned around, it literally turned its head around and looked at me as if to say, fuck off, why are you on me? And it, was, it just got off to such a bad yeah. start. And it just, I think, yeah, the horse just didn't want me there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not into horse riding no. as well. So. I won't be doing it again. Put it that no, way. Really. <laughs> Sadly. Right. So I think I'm um, going a bit to general advice. Because I feel like a lot of people would want to go to Japan and, and doing what you, you do, like YouTube on, in Japan. What do you think would be the advice? <sighs> Oh, I, well, I think I th think production quality is it needs to be higher these days. There are a lot more YouTube channels, right? And I think people want higher production standards, or it needs to be really much centered around you as a person. So if you know you have to really be comfortable in front of a camera, and if it's good, if it's going to be built around you, or become a good documentary kind of filmmaker, like uh, you know one of my good friends, Norm Tokyo Lens, he makes fantastic documentaries about Japan. They're very slick and well-produced. Um, there's Connor, who's very much about him and making him the centre of things, for better or worse. Um, I'd, say, I'd say, yeah, I mean, have good production standard and try and find something fresh, original and exciting. You know, Akihabara, Harajuku, all those things have been done a lot. So try and find something fresh and original. And also try and bring... Japanese people onto the videos as much as you can because that doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot of the time, sadly. It's just a foreigner in Japan yeah. in a foreigner sort of bubble. So if you can bring in Japanese people, all the more for it, all the better for it. Speaking of Japanese people, what do you think are key differences? I don't know how much you know about this, but if you're a Japanese person doing YouTube for Japan, mm. what are differences mm. in comparison to your channel? The production standards are a lot lower. Um, I don't mean that in a harsh way. Like, you could be shit. I mean, like, you don't need to have, like, very slick, stylish production values. Most Japanese YouTubers I see are them just, like, kneeling on their floor talking about some, some potato chips they bought or some sandwiches they bought. I, I don't really watch a lot of Japanese YouTubers. There are some good ones out there. I can't tell you what they're called because I haven't found them yet. But uh, I do find them to be very not great i feel like they've they've taken a lot of the bad the worst things about japanese tv and distilled it into youtube sometimes <laughs> like lots of silly noises and flashy things on screen and and whatnot um 
yeah, I can't say I watch it a lot, but I do know that they do they do apologize very well. I watched some YouTubers, some Japanese YouTubers apologize yesterday for going drinking in Tokyo during COVID or whatnot. And they're all just like very serious and they bow for like 10 seconds. And then they're like very solemn and sad. And it's, you just, you just don't see foreign YouTubers apologize with the same seriousness and depth as a Japanese YouTuber. But we should, should bow. Mm. But yeah, I don't know. I don't really watch. I, I can't stomach it. I just Japanese YouTubers. There are some good ones. There are some good ones. Give me some good Japanese YouTubers. Help me out here. I don't oh, know. No. I, I know your friend Chiaki, but she oh, Chiaki, is yeah, she's in, nice. She's um, awesome. But she's in Britain. She's she's cheating because she's in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's cheating. <laughs> but what I will say, I am technically PDR San Duncan is Japanese. He's right? Japanese British, he? so he's better. You know, he's he's. He's got the the humor, but yeah, he's a mix. I would say. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like in Japan, there's a lot more pressure to post a lot more regularly. You know, the pressure's there to post like daily. So a lot of YouTube channels in Japan do post incredibly frequently. Um, so maybe that's why quality is not possible when you upload that much. Is there a lot of machinery behind it? Because I would think, since it's a collective mm. community, that m there might be a, a lot of agencies. Like, are network. there a lot of agencies? Yeah. Yes, stuff around it. Yeah, there's a big one called Oom. The, the main one's called Oom, mm. which is three U's and an M. And it's, uh, yeah, the, all the big ones are there. And all the people that apologized that I saw yesterday are from Oom. They're like five or six creators from Oom. Um, yeah, I do notice the Japanese YouTubers do, do do put a lot more adverts in their videos. They have a lot more sponsors, products, and things. So, yeah, I don't. Know. I yeah, I, I just I, I can't stand them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, maybe because I feel like that a lot of advertisement is tailored to japan mm. for a lot of brands mm. and not overseas so they might not be as interested to get a sponsorship with you because they don't plan to mm. buy it overseas or something yeah or sell it I I've, and i've never i don't think i've ever really done much with any japanese youtubers i did do some sort of live show in 2015 that was a disaster um in the youtube space and i worked with like three japanese youtubers and it just it was a disastrous thing that is something i did remove from youtube uh so it's although it is unlisted it is still there so but god it was awful yeah i think uh you had it up for quite some time yeah, though it was awful Oof. makes me feel dreadful thinking <laughs> about it god yeah and i forgot what i wanted to ask uh you did um film with the idol group though oh they were cool yeah it... kiss me kiss me they were cool yeah Although tragically, and I can't believe it, the um, one of the girls actually took her own life. Uh, I think last year she actually uh, killed herself. Really, I couldn't believe it when I when I read about it. I, somebody commented on the video. I can't remember how it came up, but in the comments of that video, somebody said, "Oh, the girl's taken her life." I was like, "What? Really?" And I looked her up, and um, yeah, tragically, she she did. I, I don't know the details or why or how, but. Yeah, it's I couldn't believe it. But I guess there's a lot of pressure, isn't there, in idol groups in Japan? And mm. you, you know, you hear it a lot more than you'd like um, of, of young women taking their lives and stuff in these sort of terrible yeah. uh, kind of situations. It's very brutal working in the entertainment industry in Japan, from what I understand. So, yeah, no, it's a real shame. I very sad. Mm, that's why I was asking about YouTube if that's the same or not for Japanese people well, in I Japan think or if it's a bit YouTube is a, is a bit of liberation for a lot of um, younger Japanese folks right because mm. they can still that's the good thing about YouTube Japan is that uh, these creators can do what they want whereas when you work for an idol group or uh, a talent agency in Japan you often work very long hours for little pay and you have a lot of pressure put on you and uh, I would much rather if I was a Japanese teenager I'd much rather consider being a YouTuber than going the route of being like an idol group or an actor or something where there's a far more pressure from above. Yeah. Okay, good to know because I was a bit concerned that it might be the same for mm. YouTube. Mm. Anything else you want to say about YouTube? Um, Everything said. It's good. No, I think I've, I've, I must say I've never really regretted doing YouTube though. Um, 
it, it is for me. I think a lot of people want to do YouTube, but um, I think a lot more people want to do YouTube than should do it. Uh, how can I phrase that better? Everyone wants to do YouTube at once, but I think a lot of people don't realise how hard it is. Um, I, 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 I'm lucky. I loved editing videos and producing things before I was a YouTuber. I had a camera. I used to film things. I didn't just come into YouTube and just sort of start from scratch. I had a lot of editing knowledge, and I was very passionate about the medium of video, and I wanted to be a filmmaker. I think, you know, it's a lot harder to be a YouTuber than you think. Um, and a lot of people think... I think the sad thing, the sad truth is, a lot of people think, "Oh yeah, YouTubers make loads of money," and so they think about the money aspect of YouTube. But when I look at all the creators that I'm friends with, and I'm friends with quite a lot of YouTubers, I don't know any of them that were had that had money or revenue at the forefront of their aspirations. It's always been about they're passionate about entertaining, they're passionate about telling a story, they're passionate about uh, presenting. You know, that mm. is where success is born on youtube having that sort of passion for uh wanting to show something or uh filmmaking or making videos or presenting or voice acting um and not money and in fact it takes a very long time to make uh a wage or anything close to it on youtube like it took it must have been four or five years to to make enough money on youtube um, or certainly the same sort of salary that i made as an english teacher uh on youtube it took four or five years so yeah it takes a long yeah. time bear that in mind i think for the most people well if you're not like sitting in your room all day <laughs> i don't know what you will film in your room all day long but um i think that it's really hard to live from youtube nowadays yeah general, there's more competition like right there's a lot more competition out there so yeah. and i think oh, i have no idea what the english phrases are for that like the click thing the money you get per each click mm, click through whatever rates, is way lower cpm so, all that stuff yeah yeah cpm that, that was i was searching for it they're like so low nowadays that you have need to have a plan b so i think youtube is not enough if it's patreon for you or mm, there's just so mm. many creators doing so many different things Absolutely. And not living from YouTube. I think that's a part you really need to know because I do enjoy editing and stuff, but it would ne never be a career for me because I really don't want to think of how I get my money when I'm doing YouTube. Right, yeah. Like, you're lucky with your Patreon and some sorts. Yeah, and I'm lucky that... It works well, but you're working a lot for your Patreon as yeah, well, so yeah. it's not like only luck. I, I think I was lucky that... or I. The smartest thing I did was starting YouTube while I had a full-time job, right? And then I had three years to sort of yeah. build it up. So I wasn't sort of vulnerable um, to the terrible ad revenue of YouTube for those sort of three years. So that's what I would say. Start YouTube. If you want to do YouTube, start it while you've already got a source of income coming in, right? So you won't have that pressure on you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I would never want to handle sponsorships <laughs> or stuff. So I know that's nothing for me. Yeah, right. I think people need to think about that as well. And if you really want to spend your whole days editing or I see it a lot in Twitch streamers, like people like to play games. And so naturally they think, oh, streaming is great. A lot of people make a lot of, <laughs> not a lot, a few people making a lot of money by doing streams and i can do that as well and then they're frustrated that they just have zero viewers well yeah and, and i think that's i think a lot of creators feel they deserve attention they deserve views and you've really got to earn it you've got to spend a lot of time and energy earning people's trust and earning their attention and uh, not feeling like you deserve you deserve people to watch your twitch stream you deserve people to watch your youtube channel you've got to really hard work yeah. hard to earn it <laughs> Uh, funny that you mention it because I because I start like it's not mentionable like that, that little YouTube or Twitch I'm doing because I still have to figure it out myself. Mm. Um, but I know that I did get such a huge paranoia about supporting bigger creators that they think I want them to recognize me. So to I don't know share mm. my stuff. Mm. Whatever they could think I would want from them, especially rating and, and things. Right, yeah, yeah. So that's that's weird as well. So I actually support less creators nowadays than I did before. 
Before I started podcasting, before I started um, doing a bit of Twitch or other stuff. I think, yeah, it's a dangerous game. I It's a really interesting point. I often talk to other um, YouTubers, influencers about that sort of aspect of it. And I think the rule of thumb, certainly the rule of thumb for me is I would never collaborate with someone unless I'd known them for like a year or more. You know, you need to get to know mm -hmm. someone. I've definitely had YouTubers come out of nowhere and sort of say to me, let's make videos together. We can make views and money. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. Like I, everyone I've ever collaborated with or done something with, I've known them. It doesn't matter how many subscribers they have. I've got to know them. And that's the main thing, right? And that takes time. But uh, that's my advice. You know, if you're new to Twitch or YouTube and you want to collaborate with people, like try and find a way to get to know them. Um, comment frequently yeah. and don't, you know, seem like you're not you're not doing it for attention. Do it because you support them or whatever, or you want to encourage them, and that's the way to do it, I guess. Yeah, Good I guess point. many people are a little bit toxic about it. Like, if you look at the LA culture of YouTubers mm. uh, who just <laughs> interact with like ten percent above ten percent subscribers below, like that level. Anything too high is not good. Anything too low, you're not. It not. It's not worth yeah, time, absolutely. basically. Like, absolutely, it's true, <laughs> and it does exist. I know plenty of YouTubers that will treat smaller youtubers with disdain and very very snobby about it mm. i've i've never felt like that i felt like if you're a creator at all it doesn't really matter how many subscribers you've got as long as i i think your videos are good and i think you're an interesting person i i've i remember i've i've you know friends of lots of youtubers that have less than ten thousand subscribers at many points it's never never factored into it but uh it does exist though there is that sort of stupid culture of being yeah. snobby about it that's the other point because you can't really i well at least i have the feeling that you can't really get bigger if you not have some sort of support mm. or push or someone saying yeah that person is really interesting because the internet is just, just so full mm. <laughs> of all sorts mm. of stuff that that it's so hard to grow nowadays so you're kind of dependent on it as well, mm. uh, but you don't want to be pushy. So that's really hard. And that's why it's a massive paranoia for me. And that's why it took me so long to ask you to come on the podcast <laughs> as well. But I mean, I'd known you for years. We've been talking on things for, for years mm. now. So, you know, it wasn't yeah. really an issue, an issue. But for someone else, if they popped up and after three comments, they were like, oh, let's collaborate. Come on my podcast. And it does happen a lot. It happens a heck of a lot. I have been invited onto so many podcasts and YouTube channels and things, but it doesn't work like that. You know, you've got to know the person first, or f actually have spoken to them quite a lot over a long-term period. So that's the key. Yeah, that is true. I I think I wouldn't have asked anyone else from the bubble or people mm, you just mentioned mm. because I'm not so frequently commenting or saying stuff. Mm, and, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we were thinking about inviting a German YouTuber. She's not that big, but bigger than we are obviously uh, but how to approach that right like yeah. we don't want to be mean we don't want to push or anything just want to ask and that it's a slippery slope it's really you just gotta hope she's in a good mood the day the email arrives <laughs> 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 message her after yeah. she's had a good video come out or something <laughs> but it's tricky maybe it's tricky <laughs> yeah um but, and that's the reason why i ask as well because I know that you know that I was supporting your channel and talking to you way longer before I started all this stuff. Mm, mm. Like, oh, so that I didn't start to support you just to get a push or something, which I actually sort of afraid of a bit. But yeah, that's something I would have factored <laughs> Changing in, right? Topics. I've absolutely had people who have like joined like the Abroad in Japan Patreon, but it's been a part of, you could tell it's been some sort of quick short-term plan mm. to try and get me to do something. And so that's something you have to be wary of. It's kind of sad that you have to think about that, but it's you have to be quite cynical when you become an influencer because people will exploit that to their advantage. And um, of course, abroad in Japan is a big thing, and everything's there's millions of followers and whatnot. But you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a guy making videos in a room, and it's kind of annoying to often have to sort of bat away other people that are trying to exploit you. But it happens a lot, unfortunately. <laughs> At this scale, yeah. I uh, watched some uh, YouTube. I I don't know if that's true, but I feel like German YouTubers are a tiny bit more open about like their wages and about like the difficulties doing YouTube, about the um, 
missing the word there, whatever, like if they have friends which are big YouTubers as well, that some people do look on your numbers mm -hmm. and might not answer to you as frequently if you ha had a bunch of bad videos and that stuff happens a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. I've, I, yeah, I've, I've never... Competition, that's what I search for. Competition, <laughs> yeah. I, do, I, I know people that are like that though. I do know, I've met YouTubers that will look at things like that. But uh, yeah, that is just weird, and I think that's also a lot of stuff people should consider if they want to start this social media game. Yeah, be a nice whatever. person. Rule number one: be nice. People remember <laughs> when you're a bad person. If you say something to someone, yeah. if you make someone feel bad, they'll always remember that. And that's been my policy from day one. I don't think I've ever attacked anyone or been mean um, in any situation because people remember that. You remember the bad things far more than you remember the good right that is true um i from the like really tiny fraction i saw you handling people which i thought maybe that's more exploitation than anything else i think you handle it really well mm. to give you a compliment it's a nice compliment i'll i'll take that thank you very much <laughs> i think you're still really friendly i i honestly i might you know i might be a sarcastic monster on the videos but in real life i'm a nice normal person really Generally, I don't know. Not even I know anymore. I don't know who I am. What have I become? Who am I? <laughs> <laughs> the <Nobody> big question. <laughs> no one knows. Well, I'm I'm becoming a pool of sweat because it's 31 degrees up here and I'm dying. <sighs> but all right. It's really I turned hot off here. my aircon a little late, but um, it's really hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I think we could, uh, after this, Sort of grim note on YouTube. I I don't know. I I personally think because my opinion is so important because I'm a YouTuber. But whatever, it, I think it's both sides. You I think you should be aware about that you that you should handle YouTube as a business if you really want to do it. But on the other hand, you should have joy and fun creating videos mm. or telling mm. about whatever you you need to have a passion somewhere you want to show and not just want to be a youtuber for whatever reason absolutely because if you if you don't want know why you want to do youtube except of like being a youtuber i think that that will never work out absolutely yeah you've got to be passionate about it about the craft and the process and the creativity otherwise you're never going to enjoy it yeah. and even though i do occasionally watch craft videos and they are a lot of them aren't great mm. but i still watch them because you can see that people are really passionate about the craft stuff mm. so mm. that works out as well yeah all right so i think we're coming to tv and i will fall silent here because i'm not watching a lot of tv, TV. but as you mentioned before like one thing i notice though is that they have a lot going on on screen like a lot of pop-up things and kanji mm. and text and it's sounds and there's just too much information for me it's like overwhelming too much information but on the other hand the shows are so incredibly boring <laughs> i'm just <laughs> too thinking us. why not necessarily to japanese people although i think viewership on tv in japan is um is is, is going down a lot and youtube is sort of taking over yeah. Um, Japanese TV is very much aimed at people who are like over 60 a lot of the time because they're the only people that watch it now and so it's become this bad cycle of TV getting worse and appealing to a an older demographic but yeah I don't I've I've been invited to do things on it a lot and I, I don't think I'll be going near Japanese TV ever again to be honest um, I yeah I have a small example why you probably avoid it nowadays we have a look Yay. Are you a YouTuber? I am. God, how embarrassing. <laughs> Sorry. I remember that well, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of, that was kind of fun, I must admit. That was like the one time I didn't have a bad experience on TV in Japan. Um, that was when uh, Logan Paul, the YouTuber, did some terrible stuff in Japan and it was a big scandal and they wanted to interview mm. a foreign YouTuber to represent all foreign YouTubers and they decided to come to my apartment and ask me questions about it and yeah at the door that's what we that's what he said are you youtuber and i had to sort of awkwardly be like yeah yeah i am it was so weirdly awkward that day such a strange morning yeah. god did they rearrange your whole flat or 
They did not. Were they, they okay with it? Well, I, no, they, they came in and they did sort of move a few things around, but they were nice. They were actually good. That was Japan's biggest morning TV show called Mezumashi Terebi. And uh, they were good. They were quite fun, actually. I'd, I'd do stuff with them again. Yeah, but with that background knowledge about some YouTubers telling about Japanese TV and so on and so forth, like every time I watch TV now and see like Japanese TV interviewing foreigners, I'm like, they are going to make fun of them purposefully. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So it's really rare that they actually portray the foreigners in a good light. I mean, yeah, it can be quite... I don't know. What's, I don't know what the word is, really. I, 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 I don't know. Japanese TV always tries its best to make Japan look like a magical wonderland and everything's brilliant and magical and amazing. And it, it feels like it never really scrutinises the country. It's, it feels almost like some sort of weird propaganda. I think that's the problem I have with it. It always It's like this utopian vision of what Japan is. But, like, I remember I had to do a, a, a TV show about the local food of Yamagata Prefecture and they just it was just awful. It was just like following me around eating pickles and and the voiceover talks about how much I love the pickles, even though I thought they were pretty pretty shit by all accounts. But yeah, it was awful. I remember that. God keep me away from Japanese T V. Never again. But uh, the, like in Japanese TV, everything is oishi. Everything's delicious. Everything. Yeah. I think I've never, I've never heard a Japanese person actually saying like, oh. <laughs> I'd love to do that. After they I'd got love some to go on a like, Japanese TV show and <laughs> eat something, and instead of going, oh, oishi kore I'd be like, oh my god, that's fucking dreadful. Uma. It's like a dog's been <laughs> sick all over the plate. I'd love to do something like that, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, seriously. Like I'm waiting for the moment somebody tells the truth. I, I don't know. Yeah, it what ain't a big scandal happen. that would be. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah, um, I think this uh, being great or pretending to be great is, is of this campaign, Cool Japan. Oh, yeah. Because I was trying to find out why Japanese television is so different, but I didn't found, find much. I only found like statistics and this Cool Japan thing, what basically is a campaign to promote japan outside it sort of works because a lot of mm. people here think japan uh, is the best country to live in or whatever and have a very shifted view of japan thinking that technology is really high up in everything and mm. i don't know you discuss it so often in your podcast as well and read it that it's not entirely true mm -hmm. hence fax machines i mean cool japan is is a funny old show. And my good friend Pete, who I went to Hokkaido with, he's a presenter on Cool Japan when he's not doing Twitch. And um, he maintains that it's good, he enjoys it. I've always found it a bit of a silly, a bit of a silly, strange show because you have to sort of talk about how great an aspect of Japan is, like uh, how good are the coffee in Japan, how good the the boxes in Japan. Like It's just all a bit weird and... So it was, again, like propaganda, and I would never do well on that sort of mm -hmm. show. Yeah, just imagine another another country doing that. Like, I cannot imagine. Cool yeah, England. because we're Germans. <laughs> it's a fucking disaster. It just wouldn't work. Yeah. Cool Germany. Well, cool it Deutschland. wouldn't work in Germany. <laughs> like, exactly. Well, that was pronounced actually really well. What's cool in, in German, <laughs> by, the way. by the way? I've forgotten. Cool. Nothing. We hate Germany. Like, nothing is cool. Uh, but, but the word cool is cool. <laughs> oh, um, cool. <laughs> I, I, really? I I had a job uh, I used to be a project manager and my boss was ge uh, with German her name was Steph and she was from Munich and I discovered that German uh, German people can't pronounce the word squirrel and squirrel yeah yeah squirrel. Squirrel. what is that <laughs> I remember I tested it on her and I was like I remember I read it and I went up to her and went Steph apparently German people can't say squirrel I said can you say it and she was like no I won't say it I was like go on do it do it and I bullied her for like half an hour and then she went scroll and it, it was kind of close yeah, yeah, but kind of off it's the same with with suggestion I know it's wrong because but I can suggestion. get it out of my mouth mm. because for the longest time I couldn't even like get it out <laughs> I, I start I stopped at so, so just, I, I really tried well, to I mean to say it. I might I might have made fun of her for not saying squirrel but most I, sw I swear people in Germany speak English so well like when i went to berlin everybody spoke english incredibly well and so yeah berlin maybe well maybe berlin <laughs> yeah i don't know munich or in the south in bavaria but yeah 
German people are very good at English. However, like I met I, at a conference, I met someone who spoke really good English. I couldn't tell they are German, actually. And um, I was like, oh, uh, because apparently I have an accent. Um, so she was like, oh, you're from Germany. And then she she started speaking in like Bavarian accent. I'm like, hey, I can't imagine that being weird. <laughs> English, please. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, we're very harsh with other accents. I'm, for example, a Swabian. Um, but I do speak standard or high German, if, mm, however you want to mm. call it. And I'm getting that so often. So that's probably your why are you moved to Japan as my why are you speaking standard German? I'm so full of it because we're known for not being able to speak standard German. <laughs> Also, and sometimes so she has she knows words that I don't know the meaning of. Like yeah. It has become more rare huh. recently. But <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, I was I yeah, was always but, very but bad like at our dialects very bad different. at German. I felt the grammar was quite complicated, and uh, we had a very strange teacher who didn't really sell ger the German language to me very well because he was such a strange teacher. But uh, mm. it's a shame. I studied it for three years, and I literally remember like a handful of words, like Karl Toffen or Kino is cinema, isn't it? Ins Kino, yeah, Unter dem Tisch. Remember that? What does that mean under the bed or something? Under the table. Uh, table. table. Yes, that's literally <laughs> my table. German. Under the bed, but the, potatoes and cinema. Brilliant. I'll be a hit when I go to Germany. Uh, I mean, potato is pretty, it's a key word. So <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> we, we call ourselves potatoes, so Germans are potatoes. <laughs> and why a cool Germany would never cool work Germany. is because we never ever speak highly of Germany. Same as the UK, right? If you're not we never speak a, well. a weird person. So it's it's Maybe. really almost like forbidden. So it, 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 it I mean, just can't do it. I mean, we have some dark history, you know, like that is... <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the result. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the result that we never ever speak highly or it's really rarely well, speak so highly Japan, of Germany or anything like, again, German. They don't, they don't cover that. <laughs> yeah, but they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> they no, they don't. don't. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think, one thing if you're talking to people internationally a lot, you get, I well, I personally get tired sometimes that people always bring out World War II. I can imagine. And I think... Every time. Must be bloody annoying. <laughs> we have this uh, remembering culture, which I think is very important, but other countries did bad things as well, and all of them don't have remembering cultures... And that's where I get tired. Well, the like, UK, yeah, we've never yeah, done anything bad in the UK. We're a great, fun-loving people. <laughs> and we've never done anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's just when I get so tired mm. about hearing about it. Because I know that they don't have the culture for their own stuff. So mm. I think... And I mean, like, traveling internationally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, like, yeah. I mean, certainly in the UK, in the US, the whole World War II thing is drilled into you a lot in history, right? So naturally, when you meet mm. a German person, that is at the forefront of your thoughts. That's the first thing that always comes up. But yeah. I, you know, I I must imagine it's a bloody nightmare because it's something that happened like seventy, eighty years ago, and uh, I don't think it's yeah. yeah. But it's something that I can. I'm. It must be a, a bloody nightmare. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just I'm just a bit tired of it because I well I'm having I'm fortunate that almost none of my ancestors had anything to do it with it anyways because <laughs> i'm a mix as well mm. and it's just it's just getting a bit yeah it's tight so and, but what annoys me is if people say oh you like japan you must be really um welcomed in japan oh, because <laughs> japan and you germany were work together oh. they were allies <laughs> in world wide too well well oh god i'm getting so angry i can't stop yeah, like, talking oh, need to stop talking <laughs> so oh god that happens so often Absolutely. Oh, and Japanese people must love Germans because we are allies in World War Two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's what I wanted to mention. Like, you see the conversation going there, like, no, stop yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just don't do it. I mean, I, yeah, it, it is ridiculous. <laughs> it is ridiculous. But, I, you know, it's unfortunate. Mm. That's the way it is, isn't it, I guess? Yeah. The UK, in the UK, we feel very annoyed. good about ourselves bringing up World War Two because <laughs> we were the sort of the winning side, so... We like to brag about it on For TV all day long. And, and while the UK economy goes downwards and things go wrong, we can be like, yeah, but we won World War II 80 years ago. And everyone feels happy for 10 minutes. And so it's the sad reality of things, to be honest. But we have to move on at some point, right? We have to just look past that and be yeah. like, yeah, things happen. a lot has happened since then. 
Yeah, I think we can determine that everyone or like, but again, idiots are really everywhere. But roughly speaking, everyone is happy that Britain and America won that war. Well, <laughs> for sure, might, might have been for the best. Yes, but uh, yes, but wow. But I mean, yeah, I don't know. I never really thought about that though. When I worked with my German manager, I don't think we ever really. It never really came up. We never talked about anything like that. Yeah, because it's not our generation. Mm. Like, yeah, I think. It, it just has nothing to do with us anymore. Like, no. well, my parents are quite old, so I'm sort of still like I'm getting nervous if I have not enough food for two weeks in my house mm, mm. because that's still like such a after war thing. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but other people who with a bit younger parents yeah. aren't as invested in that anymore. Yeah, yeah. But no, I imagine. I yeah, must be strange. The old Japan Germany connection. I never thought about it before someone said that to me. It's, it's so interesting. Mm. Sometimes I think Natsuki like, oh, joked right. about it once. <laughs> when I, I think I was with a German friend, and Natsuki, and Natsuki was like, "Yeah, teammates or something," <laughs> like joking about. Oh, oh, no. oh wow! <laughs> For like, oh, wow. it wasn't serious at all. You know, it was all a bit ridiculous. You know. Okay, um, so that's the reason why we why cool Germany never would work. <laughs> but I think there is even a campaign around the cool Japan, which is also called cool Japan. If I didn't misread, which is in general promoting Japan outside, like the media, especially anime and manga. Mm -hmm. No idea why the television doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think it's, it seems to get worse every year as well. Unfortunately, Japanese TV it used to be more funny, but yeah. So, Dari, what did you figure? Because I understand you're watching a bit of TV f to learn in Japanese. And what's that yeah. English? <laughs> yeah. So um, I try to watch it here and there, like while eating, for example, just to get the hang of the language, uh, or while running when I went to the gym before Corona. Um, but I mean, I guess we probably don't need to mention again that it's just very overloaded and the jokes are very flat. Mm. And most of the time I just feel awkward watching it. But um, but then you probably have heard of the TV show Terrace House. Yeah, Terrace House. Before it yeah, it was taken off air, of course, after yes. last year. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, you mentioned the one topic about like social media and bullying that is in, I guess, the social media mm. side of things. But Terrace House crosses over from the i mean it's a netflix show so it's not technically yeah. television but it's more the television format but with people who are active on social media so yep. it crosses into the social media world and i mean it ended really badly but maybe yeah because we mentioned that before like the pressure on people we don't need to talk about it again but um, what i've also noticed is the culture of dating that is portrayed in terrace house the what sorry have you seen that? The dating culture. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I did watch Terrace House for a bit last year. I was, I remember I was getting into Japanese study again, and I watched Terrace House just because it was easy to watch on Netflix, and it had English subtitles and Japanese mm, subtitles, yes. and I could, I could use it for study. And, and also, you know, because it's just young people having normal, everyday conversations, mm. you could learn additional colloquial Japanese expressions, but... It was all. It was all. It was clearly very staged. And uh, a friend of mine, who knew somebody that had gone in Terrace House, basically told him that it was more or less planned and scripted, which you can kind of tell by watching it anyway. But the dating scenes are always so awkward. It's just always so weird and silly. And yeah, I really didn't like the show, even though I watched it for educational reasons. I hated it. I thought it was, it was so contrived. You know, it was very just awkward and had this really happy wonderful image of things um and it, it mm. ended in a very sinister way didn't it with Hannah Kimura taking her life because mm. of bullying on there um which and the, and the reason she got bullied was she was told to act a certain way in this show that made her look bad and then you know so what a shame <laughs> will it be back again probably yeah, not yeah and i, I would <laughs> Uh, probably not but what I would like to outline like what she did wrong is like slap uh, the guy's head like on the ground or mm. something like that so in I think western culture eyes she did nothing that bad like, yeah nothing happened there they had an argument and that's about it I think it, but, it was very unladylike that, um, in Japan yeah. right to sort of stand up to a guy 
Oh no. Yeah. 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 But uh, no. I, Actually, when I watched the scene, when I, I I thought that she was was doing brilliant. Like I was kind of proud of her for doing yeah. that. Yeah. I I didn't think anything was wrong with it really. I didn't even I watched it and I was like, oh, was that it? Like, good God. There's mm. just some weirdos on Twitter bullying her and whatnot and uh, you know, just wouldn't let it end. There is that unpleasant side to there's a there's a lot of bad people online in Japan, netizens who are very vocal and uh, abusive, I think. You know. In Japan people are very polite in everyday life, but I think when they're behind a computer screen, like a lot of countries, right? People are. It brings out the worst in people. We feel like we can say things and act ways that we wouldn't do in everyday normal life. And uh, Japan is no exception there, you know. But it's all the more jarring and striking for it because people in Japan aren't necessarily used to receiving that in uh, in everyday life. Although I guess bullying in schools is a big thing here. That's true, actually. But yeah, I heard about yeah, it. It's not good. I think bullying in different countries is another really, <laughs> yeah. could be another really big episode because it's so different, I think, for every country. Yeah. Like what I heard from the UK, it didn't want me to have children in, in a school in UK, actually. Yeah. But I don't know if we are so much better, I'm not sure. Well, yeah, British schools are horrific. We're very mean, making teachers cry and all sorts. Yeah, we're, um, I was a good school, but we were still evil to our teachers. And there was a lot of bullying. There was lots right. of bullying that went on. Absolutely. Maybe I was just on luck that it wasn't much bullying, but we are like <laughs> on the ignoring part. So we uh, cast people out by ignoring them, not inviting them, and that's bullying in the end as well. So mm, we do that yeah. a lot. Yeah, and I'm happy that you made the point yourself that um, you're normally really friendly in Japan because we talked about this before. And I said, or I more or less <clears throat> asked why you think that it has so much more an effect on people and women in Japan than it has in the Western countries. Mm. Is it more bullying? Is it meaner? Why that is? And I think you said exactly that, that it's just the culture that you're normally really very nice to each other mm. Mm. in Japan. And women are supposed to sort of be quite subservient and uh, extra polite and extra, you know, not outspoken, basically. A good Japanese woman, the image of a good... Uh, Japanese woman is someone who's not outspoken, someone who's very polite and nice and keeps their opinions to themselves. Uh, we we talked about that a lot, like all the university stuff and the schools. I don't know. Did you hear that as well? That high schools did that What's... as well. Not only universities that they. Oh, what was it again? I think um, boys exams. needed to have lesser points in exams than girls yeah so the boys needed less like um, points oh, in yeah. the entry for high school i think that was right and then there was also the scandal of um points getting taken off of women's entrance for university yeah god that was yeah. awful for i remember medical. that it was like a year or two back now mm. uh was it i can't yes. remember what it's for to be a doctor or something or a nurse i can't remember yeah. the profession yeah. there was a profession where yeah they deducted points from girls because they discovered that the <laughs> uh, japanese women were performing a lot better in exams than the guys so they made it more fair by removing points from girls and it was a national scandal lots of people got sued it looked very bad and yeah it was dreadful absolutely shocking really i can't believe that happened still yeah and, and high schools is, are doing this as well and that's a bit newer i think mm, the scandal mm. yeah yeah so that um boys don't need I think they need to reach 300 something points and women like or girls 500 or so. yeah. it was like ridiculous it was a big difference yeah yeah, yeah I, I, what shocked me most about that is I talked to my old professor about it um, like and he is really open minded and international and he mm. said yeah he of course he thinks it's bad but he kind of understands why people think that's a good idea to do I'm like that is pretty shocking to me like that mm. he can still say that he kind of understands I'm like oh okay, wow, there's a lot that needs to be done. I guess there is that view in Japan still that uh, women are the ones that ra have the kids, raise the kids and whatnot. Um, and even women, Japanese women hold it. I remember speaking to a Japanese uh, yes. teacher I worked with and she was like, I, I said something like, do you think men and women are equal? And she said, no. Um, I was like, oh, okay. She, she said that, I, she said, like, you know, biologically, we're the one that have the kids and so we should you know, stay at home and whatnot. 
So, you know, she held that view as well, a sort of conservative view that uh, that women shouldn't, that yeah. men are sort of better than women in Japanese society. So, yeah, I was I was shocked but not overly surprised at the whole uh, point deduction scandal when it happened a year or two ago. Yeah, you're not surprised anymore. No, it's no. really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> Yes, but that's where you can see that uh, Dari is from the middle of Germany and I'm from the south. Mm. Um, because there is really a huge difference between the south and the middle of Germany because I have been raised with that a lot. Like, why are you you not moving uh, to your boyfriend? How mm, will you ever start mm. a family? And uh, just getting that a lot in the south. Uh, so I'm actually not as much shocked as she is mm, about mm. this behavior because I was l like mm, yeah well, maybe luckily i was never told that <laughs> yeah that's not my my parents never did that but it's still society who does that mm, a lot yeah. and and strangers asking you when you will get children it's just <laughs> really really <laughs> awful um but it's like so engraved in germany like gender equal language as a thing because it's not gender equal by default mm, mm. like if you say physician in english it can be you can be male or female that's not the the case in german oh, so right. ärztin is female arzt is male and you normally always fall back to say the male version oh yeah funny thing is though the female version is mostly sorry for the german lecture but um the female version is normally an extension of the male mm, version mm. So you can just say the female version and you have the male version within it. And that's gender equal language. And I can't do it. I really want to do it for the podcast, but I can't pull it off. It's so annoying because it's so engraved in me that like men going to work and stuff. <sighs> Pretty annoying. But it's also in the language. It's not really like, for example, in my understanding, yeah. it's not the man going to work, but it's just also in the language, of course, coming from that, that yeah. we would rather use the male version than the female version. Um, and for example, in a few scientific papers, even, uh, even in English, people wanted to point out that I use her as the default instead of him. Mm, if I mm. talk about a random person, for example, of course, at this point, we can just use they. But um, I think in the beginning, like 10 years ago, it was like, okay, just go to her instead of him. Right. If you would mm. naturally write him, just write her and keep consistent just to, to have one paper out in the masses that actually uses a different gender. So, yeah, I mean, in Japan, yeah, I guess it's kind of a gender neutral language in most respects you wouldn't say yeah. her or him necessarily you typically you wouldn't even state the subject or the pronoun you know or you'd say the name of the person <laughs> just skip that yeah. <laughs> too, too much effort <laughs> skip it to the point where I have to sometimes, because we have a dog, and uh, sometimes I have to ask my partner, like, well, who do you mean, me, the dog? Mm. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Bloody nightmare. A lot of the time, you have to make a lot of assumptions with Japanese. Are you hungry? Who? <laughs> <laughs> I have to make a lot of assumptions. Um, but you never really told us about your bad experience on TV, so you told about the good experience. On TV? Talking, on TV and yeah, talking about Logan Paul, but what were... What were, was, whatever difficult language, your bad experiences? Well, I think just always having to be overly positive about things and not give your real opinions. Like uh, the two or three times I've done Japanese TV, the sort of producer director has told me to say certain things like, say it's delicious, say you're happy, say you're sad. You know, they're sort of, they have an image of what they want you to say and you you have to sort of go along with their plan. And I didn't like that feels very inauthentic the opposite to youtube by all means you know so yeah I, I don't i don't think i'll be going on japanese tv again i can't really envisage a, 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 a position where i'd want to go on you know ever again but i can't i think a lot of people dream about going on japanese tv but the reality is it's uh it's not good and it's not fun and there's no money either <laughs> you don't get paid very well for it yeah oh that's a great thing here like do you want to be uh, in television or something which makes money but you're not willing to pay mm, in mm. the end that's also a huge thing here it's not well paid yeah. don't japanese tv is not a well-paid thing at all so don't do it mm. <laughs> there's no upside to it i do remember uh, that in your podcast, you had Shala as guest once, mm. and she told there, I think, that she was told to speak Japanese with a more English accent, so she would sound more foreign. 
Which I thought, so, wow. She might have done, <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't remember why? the story, but that sounds like the sort of thing that, that would happen, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised by that. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when I see these, like, um, Ask a Gaijin, blah, 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 TV shows, um, they speak very good Japanese. And then at some point they they uh, speak English. And you're like, they probably have been told to speak English. Yeah. Because their Japanese was perfectly fine. Absolutely, yeah. But then you have this, like, odd sub over it. and like hey, Yeah, bye. they'll always have someone do a voiceover or dub it over or something. Yeah, it's all a bit odd. I don't know. It reinforces that sort of insider outsider feeling that uh being in japan you're kind of outside the circle a little bit as a foreigner and whatnot and uh tv reinforces that i think more than any other medium in japan mm. that image i do remember the <laughs> pen thing the pen oh, oh the yeah pen Kurawa pen ah <sighs> But yeah. on the other hand, I'm quite glad that it wasn't German because normally we are being mocked for having a very strong language. <laughs> What's Kurawa pen there in German? Das ist ein Stift. Das ist ein Stift. Stift. Yeah, oh, right. Stift is pen, is it? Stift, wow. yeah. Uh, you're get actually back into learning German. doing all right in pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can do the st pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> get it. So many people have problems with that. It's my, my three years of German from 20 years ago coming back to me. <laughs> it's all coming back. <laughs> By the end of this podcast. The other words as fluent. well. Uh, it was all worth it. <laughs> yeah, we, we could have done it in German. Why are we talking in this? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's so hard to tell about Japanese TV because there's not a whole lot happening there instead, except of like food re <laughs> this is reviews. Awfully and, true. <laughs> and which is bit, which is a bit sad because, of course, like the wacky stuff goes around mm. and people think Japanese television is full of wacky stuff, but it actually isn't. It's, I yeah, mean, Takeshi's Castle, <laughs> not on TV for so many years anymore. Yeah. And very few interesting things there. Yeah, but what also gets to me is like in these evening shows or whatever, it's maybe the whole day, where there is like an audience and they talk about the subject and maybe they have some clips playing, whatsoever. And there's always, they always look odd. Like every person is kind of a character. One has like super thick eyebrows. One is like hmm. a man, but dressed like a crossdresser, I guess. <laughs> but that is his character. Like nobody is normal That's true. or some sort of normal. Yeah. It's like, why? Why do they do Gotta that? Gotta be larger than life sort of character, right? Some sort of clown figure, uh, someone who you wouldn't see yeah, in everyday life. Yeah, they make life. fun of themselves, most of them. Yeah, it's true, actually, yeah. A lot of the biggest people in Japan, the biggest talent, are kind of very odd figures who are very different from most normal Japanese people. Um, like Mask, was it Masco Deluxe? The guy, the really large guy, dressed like a woman. I've never really got what's yeah, that all about. Like, Yeah, it's, it's very much the subject of comedy and parody but uh yeah i can't it's just all a bit odd it's almost making these clown figures <laughs> yeah the slapstick humor is weird because i think i have a tiny bit of slapstick humor but it's like really subtle mm, mm, mm. <laughs> and but it's in your face and that's just way too much for me as well <laughs> Yeah, it, the line it ends for me when there's a guy in diapers hitting somebody else in diapers. You're like, no, <laughs> yeah. That, that, no. Yeah, it's unwatchable. It really is. Okay, so moving on, I think. Anyone, anything else to say? Anyone? No. <laughs> no. No more Japanese TV. All right. The last question I wanted to ask you, it was around newspapers, because you've been covered a whole lot in newspapers in the last few, I don't know, days, years whatever is that a better experience than television or how is it different um yeah generally they're they're a bit better if we kind of talk about what i do they're always they always want to know why you're in japan why are you here what's going on and like i feel like when people come to the uk we don't really ask them why you're in the uk but in japan that is something you've got to answer a lot and that's in everything i do newspapers tv or whatever that's the thing they want to know why are you here what are you doing here what drove you here and if you don't go oh, i like pokemon and it was great so i thought let's go to the japan because there's pokemon there if you don't have a clear-cut answer like that you're fucked because you've got to spend the next 20 minutes trying to define it and i my, the reason i came to japan i don't even know what it is i think it's, i want i thought 
it looks like a great culture. I've always wanted to go. Let's go and try it. Maybe it'll be a, an adventure. Maybe it'll be a good story out of it. Um, that was it, really. You know, I liked I liked Japan a lot. I thought it was an interesting place, but I didn't know a great deal about it. But that's not really an acceptable answer. It's got to be something easier. Like I did karate <laughs> at school. Then I thought, let's go to the place where karate is from. Let's go to the like. It, you need a clear cut answer. If you don't have one, it's a nightmare. Um, that's the the downside. But other than that, the newspapers are great. <laughs> other than that, it's fine. I do. I do remember that they made you make a picture of you filming yourself with camera at yeah. hand, and you were mocking it a lot. <laughs> yes, as a YouTuber, you've got to have a camera behind you at all times in shot somewhere because that's what youtubers do we have a camera behind us in the room or i've got to hold a camera for every tv show or newspaper article Mm -hmm. as a youtuber you've got to be holding a camera somewhere you know it's ridiculous (laughs) why why it's a nightmare but i think your answer might be the best answer if you want to stay in japan because if you don't know a lot or you don't have a lot of false information or hopes, you not get disappointed so fast. Because I feel like yeah. a lot of people moving to Japan having a really hard time in their like, first two years. Yeah. Probably everyone, but some people do have an even harder time by having too high expectations about the place from wherever they get them. Yeah, I think a lot of people hit the 10-year mark in Japan and they either embrace Japan or they start to hate it a lot. And um, I see that a lot with people I know who are here in the long term. They start to hate Japan, unfortunately. Luckily, I'm not in that position at all. I still love the country. I think it's fantastic. But uh, I yeah, I don't know why that is. But Japan... Uh, yeah, I think a lot... And I, I did put out a video, didn't I, um, about a month ago called 12 Reasons Not to Move to Japan. And that was about crushing expectations. <laughs> like, I've sung the praises of Japan a lot over the last nine years now, 200 videos. Like, I've tried to showcase the best of japan and maybe i've been too nice at times i haven't scrutinized the country um so that video was sort of about doing that and sort of looking at the other side of things but yeah i think there's a lot of reasons not to move to japan if i think mainly if it's if it's if it's your nat- the nature of your character is the biggest reason not to come here i th- i don't know a lot of I, I think a lot of my friends and family wouldn't enjoy the country and wouldn't be able to adapt um and so i wanted to sort of warn those sort of people that uh, I don't think you might not necessarily enjoy living here so but I don't know yeah Yeah, people do have a lot of expectations Mm, about the country I didn't because I really just wanted to visit Darium (laughs) because (laughs) we weren't in a good place both both of us and I was like really fascinated and that's how we ended up making this podcast together hmm yeah, I think you started literally everything like from that trip, right? Like Instagram, <laughs> YouTube. I don't know how when I started something, but I started Instagram because I wanted to have my pictures somewhere mm. of Japan because mm. I always delete them on my phone. I only have like new ones which aren't synchronized. So I I don't know. I have like the best on there. So that's why I started it. Nice. Yes. Oh, I wanted to say we discussed your video, this podcast, a few oh. episodes ago, mm. like two something and you will never figure out what we said because we can't speak German. <laughs> no. I'll have to send it to my old German manager to translate. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we were, we were nice. We, I think we just um, talked about Dari's uh, experiences. For example, physicians, because mm. that can be very different. Aha, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else, anyone? Um, <laughs> no. No. Nothing I can think of. <laughs> yeah, after I I don't know if I have a summary about YouTube and social media and stuff in Japan or why it's because I really try to figure out why is Japanese television so different. But I'm for a researcher, I'm really shit at researching stuff <laughs> because you always need like the one paper which leads you to all the other papers, mm. but you really need to find one of them. And I couldn't. Maybe because I'm a computer scientist and I'm searching on the wrong sites probably i don't know or japanese academia is in japanese as well a lot so they don't it is publish yeah. so much in english and that's another factor so i didn't find anything sadly <laughs> i really wanted to get into that won't happen yeah then i would say thanks for your time 
Yeah, thanks for having me. I think we've covered a, a lot of cool stuff about YouTube, about Japan, and um, yeah, hopefully folks listening will actually get to come to Japan soon when the country reopens, and uh, yeah. if you want to do YouTube, try it. Just make one video, see how you feel about it, and uh, you know, you'll either like it or you won't, but you'll never know until you try yeah. it. Same as anything. I think it takes a bit longer. Yeah. If you work, really. <laughs> That's true. But... Uh, but yeah. But you have to start with your one video and it will be shit. Inevitably. There's no way yeah. around it. Inevitably. Yeah. That first video won't be good. Not only the first. <laughs> no, and the second and but it's like every video is a tiny bit better and that's enough I would say. Absolutely. All right. Then we have the tradition to say good night. No matter which, <laughs> no <laughs> which, matter the time. <laughs> uh, which time it is because it's not night for me, but then I would say good night to you both. And have a nice evening, night, or whatever. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Bye bye.